Well, good morning. Welcome to Industry Day at City College. It's nice to have a great group here. How is everyone doing today? Good. Great. Well, my name is Jane Mitchell, and I am very pleased to have been asked by Tony Amat, who's coordinated this, uh, to be here to speak with you today and to help the program along this morning. So welcome to those of you who are here and those of you watching all around San Diego with the Office of Education and other high school groups. We're glad you're here. So this is the world of uh, virtual meetings, and so we're here together to learn some things and to have some fun. Show of hands, even if you're watching this virtually, how many of you have a lot of experience in photography or video? A Little bit, okay. How many have no experience in that? All right, we've got one up here in the front row. Um, how many of you have aspirations of making this your career, that you wanna be involved in television or film? Okay, we even have some old guys in the back, thank you. <laughs> still aspiring. Um, and have you all been inspired by something, something you saw, something you watched, uh, someone you met? Or you just think it sounds like a lot of fun? Any of those things? Well, um, today it's going to be a lot of fun, but also you're going to learn some things about some of the new technology that's that's here. And it has changed over time. If you all are about maybe 18 years old, you grew up with iPhones, right? You grew up with smartphones. Um, you can do a lot of things with, with just this. Um, but there are a lot of other elements to photography, to videography, to the different digital platforms that exist. So Today, you're going to get to see some of those new things. Um, let me just give you a few ideas of some of the industry reps who are going to be here. Panasonic Lumix, Canon, Sony Corp, Fujifilm, and Tamron Lenses. They'll also have, um, you'll have access to information on student programs that might give you some discounts when you show your student ID, so that's a good thing. We're going to have some additional speakers presenting uh, Mickey Strand, Veterans Portraits, Portrait Lighting Programs, Jody Silly, um, uh, and people from the Film Consortium, and also the San Diego County Fair. So if any of you have any aspirations of maybe entering some of your work in the county fair, um, you'll get to know a little bit about that. But before we dive into that, I want to take a few minutes to share with you why I think I was asked to be here today. So if you're, a lot of you are younger, so you may or may not have remembered Channel 4 Padres, maybe when you were a little kid watching some of those games and the pregame or the shows before or after. I had the privilege for 15 years it ended in 2011 officially, that I was able to interview players and tell their life stories. And when I started this in 1997, really nobody was doing this quite like that. So I wanted to connect the fans with the players. And that was the idea that we wanted to connect that and have the players uh, more familiar uh, to um, about who their fans were, but really for the fans to get to know who these guys are, that they don't just show up and play a game, that they were young and had dreams and aspirations and trials and tribulations too, right? Nobody just suddenly becomes Tony Gwynn or Trevor Hoffman or Manny Machado, for those of you watching the Padres this season and the last few years. So I did that for 15 years and it was really wonderful. But what I learned about that is that there are so many pieces to someone's story. It's not just sitting down and doing an interview. It's the scrapbooks, it's their memories, it's the people who were part of their life as they went along their journey. And it was important to me as a storyteller to meet their parents and to go into their scrapbooks and to have all these different elements to then put together to show to the viewer. Now, how do you do that? Well, first of all, it's a lot of work. Second of all, you work with great people and talented people as well. I worked with a wonderful editor and photographer and a whole team at Channel 4. And we worked together to put together these, this puzzle. It really is a puzzle. 
Now, in the beginning, uh, when I started out in my career in television, news reporter in Texas, I did all the shooting. Well, not the shooting, but I did all the editing. I did learn how to shoot. And I wasn't, whoopsie, I wasn't great at it. Stand by. <laughs> I wasn't great at the editing, but it gave me a real appreciation of how many pieces go into a story, how to make something so that your viewer isn't seasick or dizzy as you're watching something, and how to do a lot of that in a very short amount of time, sometimes 30 seconds, sometimes a minute 30, and on occasion, a longer piece. By my second job, thankfully, when I got to Tulsa, Oklahoma, I worked with some amazing photographers and editors who I just handed it over. So I still had to write and create the script and put all the pictures and the words together, but then they would uh, combine that in the edit room, right? You all have done some editing, I presume? Now you can do it on your iPad or your phone. It's uh, very different than several years ago. And it's also different than if you were to go into a uh, production house. You know, there's a lot of different ways to do the editing, but the concept is the same, right? You're taking sound and pictures, a story, uh, words, music, all these things combined to create a final product. Now, a few things that I would like to pass along because sometimes you think that because you have a camera or uh, whatever device you're using, just because you have it, you should use it. Or the tools that you have because it looks cool. In my opinion and from my experience, when you're trying to reach out and to have people on the other end connect with the story, whether it's a person's story, whether it's something really serious, it's an issue, or it might even be your imagination or something from you know a fantasy, whatever that is, you want to make sure that they're not distracted by something that isn't germane to that story, to the message that you're sharing. Whether it's your message or someone else's message, it's still your job, right, to put that together so that the person on the other end, in the back row or on the other side of the world, is watching, right? How many times have you tuned something in and you're like, okay, well, why is that person standing over there and jumping up and down? That's like annoying. It's, it's, it's distracting from the person who's sitting there. So your eye is part of your job is to, is to take the picture through the lens, right? And what's in that shot that you're getting? Now, I'm not a professional photographer, but I do, I have been around long enough to know that, for example, when we would go into the clubhouse or the locker room of the athletes, and I do write about this in my book because it's it's kind of funny, but it's one of the things is that we would have certain things hanging on the locker in the lockers, and um, which is perfectly normal to have in a locker room, you know, underwear and weird things, like, you know, not weird, but things that it's like I don't want to see that in my shot, so with hangers and other things, we would, we would remove those things because I wouldn't want someone at home looking at me, talking to them and saying, why is there, you know, deodorant or underwear or different things hanging around Jane, when you can simply remove that from the shot and it makes it perfectly fine. We're not changing anything other than not having a distraction. And that can go for lots of things. So think about as you're shooting, as you're editing, what you want in your picture and what do you not want in your picture. That's just one example. But it was an, one we discovered early on because um, it would have been really embarrassing, don't you think, if we'd seen like a players with their name and it's like, okay, there's their personal items. That just wouldn't have been very nice. Um, so just because you can shoot something or move the camera around uh, doesn't mean necessarily that that's the right way to do it or maybe you like that maybe, and that's okay too. But just think about what that final product is going to look like. Who is your audience? What do you want them to see? What do you think is not necessarily appropriate beyond the obvious? Um, so art is really wonderful, and we all are creative. I'm, I'm guessing, do all of you 
consider yourselves creative people, would you say? You're creative and you're working on that, right? Um, you can be naturally creative, but you still need to hone your skills. Uh, I didn't know a lot about the things that I ended up doing. I just could see that I wanted to be part of it. Um, so in the very end, when you're done with your piece, before you put it out to the world, in whatever format that might be, whatever platform, take, take a step back and look at it and make sure that whatever that is going out is something that you feel good about. You may not agree or you may disagree with the content, it depends what you're doing of hard news or serious thing, or maybe it's just something fun that you just want to have, um, just inspire somebody. But take a look back and my little go-to trick is that look at it as if you've never seen it before. Look at it like you're seeing it for the first time because even though people now can stop and pause and fast forward and rewind and all of that, you know, when you go to a movie, you're not doing that right. You're watching it all the way through if you're going to watch it the traditional way. Um, and so your viewer only gets to see it the first time once. So think about what that impact is on them and to leave out something that it might be a flash frame. It could be something technical. And do you know what a flash frame is? Okay, a flash frame, it's kind of an old fashioned term, but the idea is when you're editing, if you have, you put two images together or video or normally it's for video and there's accidentally one thing left in there. Let's say you're doing a line. Do you edit with Final Cut Pro or Premiere? What are you all editing with? What is? Oh, you're only doing still images. Okay, well, you're gonna get there because Every, you know, it's just part of what we're all doing in the digital world, right? Well, it would be something that's left on the line. It's like, whoop. It's like, whoa, what was that? Well, it was, you know, just something accidentally left on the line. And when it all came together, so you go back in and you take that out and then it's nice and smooth. Um, different for still images, but still when someone walks up and sees your picture, whatever that is, um, did you accidentally have, you know, a boom mic hanging over? It's like, oh, let's crop that out. Same idea. Um, so those are just some things that of my many years of doing this and being around some extremely talented people that I've learned from them. They've hopefully learned from me. I remember when Tony came to this, uh, Petco Park. I, is this okay to say, Tony? Uh, <laughs> I asked Tony, <laughs> a photographer, but he came and he shot. Um, I was doing the interview with Trevor Hoffman. You all know who Trevor Hoffman is, Hall of Fame pitcher. Anyhow, he was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 2018. And um, Tony came to shoot behind the scenes pictures of us. And he also did some video. And the pictures were spectacular. Uh, some of the video, was a little woo it was like okay so i did a little we did a little lesson and he's took those notes and has just really um, improved his videography and that's what we all do right you're always learning even when you're 17 or 18 or today's my birthday so i won't say how old i am but <laughs> Uh, every year, every t every project, thank you, you're learning. So I am just really pleased to be here to impart a little bit of my experience and um, not as a, a shameless plug, but I did write a book about my life, my career, how I got into television. I was in, I wanted to, since eighth grade, I knew what I wanted to be a news reporter since eighth grade. And I worked through high school and just through college and and I my dream came true because I worked at it and um, it also has the scripts but it, it tells about the thought process too of putting something together so if you're ever interested in eventually getting in and doing video and storytelling in that way uh, and also just some guidelines that I believe are important as you're out there uh, in this very creative world. Um, and I, I have books on my website, but it's, it's really more to inspire students where you are in your path right now 
and um, taking advantage of all these amazingly smart, creative people and opportunities that you might have uh, in San Diego. It's a, uh, it's a lot of stuff has happened in San Diego. I just come from a one part of it with television, documentaries, biographies, which is what I do now. But a lot of people that you're going to meet today not only have the tools, but also have some great tips and wisdom. So uh, I will leave it at that for now. Yeah, well, that's one thing I wanted to say that I had in my notes, that one of the, the nicest compliments I I get over the years and, and even now is that you make it look so easy and so comfortable. And, and that I absolutely, even though one thing may be a personality, but it's preparation. And I don't know how many of you maybe have taken journalism classes or um, learned anything about interviewing, but this is an important part, even if you're a photographer or a videographer, because you'll always be interacting with people unless you're going to shoot landscapes or something. But if you're ever going to be interacting with people, it's important to have that um, that easiness and able to talk with them and make them feel comfortable. But it's also preparation. A lot and lot of hours go into preparing an interview, even someone who I may know over time, because they're taking their time to be with me and for me to share their story and I want to respect their time. And so I delve in and I get, I find out the things that I should know or that are easily available, especially with the way we have the world of Google and, you know, the internet. Um, but then you can settle into the interview or the photo, photo shoot even with some uh, real comfort and when you're taking pictures of people, especially, you want them to feel comfortable, right? You want them to feel, look at the camera and do whatever that is. So, so that idea of um, connecting with your subject, whatever that might be, it's that you feel comfortable in your own skin and that you are respectful about them and their time, what they're doing. Yes? I'm curious, when you're interviewing somebody, do you match their tone and their body language? Hmm, do I? You know, do you yeah. Know like if they're a fast talker, you, you know what I mean? Like, if they're, <laughs> do I match the, when I'm interviewing someone, do I match their tone and body language? Well, I try to always have good posture, which is hard sometimes, depending on what chair I'm in. Um, yeah, you, you do. You take, you go at their pace a little bit. I try to set the tone, though. I said, look, you may have told this story a hundred times to somebody else, but you know what? I've never heard it. So let's start from the beginning. And I t do tend to interview from a chronological standpoint. That's what I do when I do biographies. Um, but that doesn't mean that you're not, you know, yucking it up for a few minutes in the beginning and having fun and, you know, the light falls over, or the doorbell rings or, you know, and that's okay. Um, but if they're talking really fast, I do, you know, maybe just oh, let's take a breath or I'll do something, but I don't ever want to tell them how to be. But most of the time they aren't talking really fast. They're relaxed and it's like, okay, well, here we go. So, but um, yeah, you have to kind of roll with it too. And we had three camera shoots. So you have to definitely <laughs> be aware of what's going on. Okay. Okay. All right. Let's start with you then. What's your name? Madison. Madison. And you are with Canon. Correct. Okay. Yes, so Canon. what will you be, can we, can everybody see you? What will you be showing uh, these students today? I will have a presentation about the Canon R5C, which is a hybrid uh, stills and video camera. Perfect. Great. Okay. I'm, I'm guessing it's Joshua. Joshua from Sony. Yes. Okay, step on over here, Joshua, no so problem. we can see you. And what will you be sharing with? Yes, yeah, so we the, visit Sony on the fourth floor, and I will be doing a presentation on overall Sony technology and how it works with um, your shooting and video. Okay, perfect. All right, come on up. I'm Michael with Fujifilm. Uh, rolling a quick All video right, here. Good. We're going to be showing our Frame IO automatic upload. Uh, this is going into the cloud right now. Wow. I'll also be talking about our uh, cameras, hybrid filmmaking in general. Great hybrid. I'm hearing that word a lot. That's that's the that's where we are right now. Huh? Hi, Hi, I'm uh, Greg Becker. I'm with Tamron. Uh, we make lenses for most of the cameras out there. 
Uh, I'm up on the fifth floor and we'll be uh, showing product up there. Okay, great. All right. Yep. Okay. Come, on. Come on up. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> I'm Jody with the Film Consortium San oh. Diego. Oh, was I supposed to introduce her? Okay, well, here, go ahead, Jody. I'm Jody with the Film Consortium <laughs> San Diego. Is this on? Song. Yeah, yeah, it's oh. it's for the feed. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, no one's got headphones. Oh man, poor guy. Uh, I'm with the Film <laughs> Consortium San Diego, and I'm here to talk about resources, events, uh, and uh, networking opportunities for filmmakers and photographers in San Diego, where you can meet other people around the community, other colleges, high schools, and professionals who are working in this field right here in our city. All right, perfect, great, thanks. Step on over here. I'm right here. <laughs> Hi, I'm Larry McDaniel. I'm the educational coordinator for George's Camera. So we're up on the fifth floor. Come up and see us. I've got prizes, sign up for the prizes, but we do a lot of the vending. We, we carry a lot of the equipment that the people are going to be talking to you about, um, and we uh, sell it to you, basically. We also have a rental department. We have an educational department. Uh, so come upstairs, see us. Okay. Wow. George, 30 years ago, I want you to know, 30 years 30 ago, years. Uh, when my father was, he was sick and it turned out he had ALS, but one of the things he wanted to do, four of the things he wanted to do before he passed away, uh, tell his life story, which was, I did do that for him, but he wanted to have all of their home, the move, the film, actual film movies transferred. And we went to George's and do you know that we still have that? We did digitize it eventually, but you all, uh, helped us capture those memories from before there was sound That's on film. so important for family. That is yeah. so important for family. So, thank yeah. you to George's. So. Oh, hello. Hi, come on up. I'm Mickey. Red square. <laughs> under the red, under your mark. Okay. Hit the mark. Uh, I'm Mickey Strand, and I'm actually going to be presenting next uh, about taking a personal project and turning it into something larger than you ever conceived that it could be. So telling people stories. All right. Fantastic. That's, yeah. that's what we're, we are, aren't we? Storytellers. Good. Okay. Are we... Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say one word. Okay. I'm Tell Tony. Us. Hello. Right. Well, Good. Nelson Photo and Videos here. Um, I am the coordinator for the event. So um, I'm, I'm glad that everybody made it today. And uh, this is, these are all my best friends right here. <laughs> and so um, uh, I hope you guys enjoy the day. It's, it was quite a task putting it together because I always thought they were going to cancel it, but ah. they did not. So I'm glad everybody made it today. So thank you. And then um, we're going to do a group picture. Sure. And then you're going to do first the introduction to. to yes. Do you want to? OK. Yeah. Gonna do a group picture. And then you can yeah. just take it up. Right. Sounds good to me. Oh, am I in the red square? Yes, I am. <laughs> Katie, go ahead and introduce okay. yourself. Hi. Hi, everyone. My name is Katie Ferris, and I'm the uh, assistant professor here in the photo program at City College. Um, so if you have any questions today about the program itself, I'd encourage you to come talk to me at any point um, during the sessions that we have. Another thing is uh, we have amazing photo facilities. Like I've seen um, photography departments all over the state, all over the country, all over the world, um, and ours are really, truly some of the best. Um, we have two floors of dark rooms and digital labs, so please uh, check out our facilities, um, see our gallery, which is on the fifth floor. We have a number of different um, photo shows going on over the course of the semester, including a black identity photo show that's up right now, so please tour the facilities, um, and welcome. You know, it's been a long uh, time in COVID, and we're really happy to have you here, so thank you. Awesome. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to set this back. Okay. Everybody line up in one line, please. Okay. We got a wide angle lens up here, so we're good to go. And I don't want crappy. Okay. Honey, this is on channel four, Valley, Todd, or just all of them? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I got everybody to smile. Okay. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Okay, they're going to be upstairs now. Yes, thank you. And thank then, you. Um, and I just wanted to say, yep. if, if you're ever interested, you can just go to my website, yep. jamiemitchell101.com. You can see some of the different videos and things I've done over the time. The book is there. Um, I always am open to answering questions. If you do your research and then you have questions, uh, you can shoot me an email, just janemitchell101 at gmail. And um, I, I like to keep the the inspiration going if you uh, if I can be of any assistance okay thank you for being here today have a great time and learn a lot okay. 
Uh, my name is Mickey Strand, and I am currently a uh, portrait photographer. Uh, I've been a lot of, of photographer, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about my current project that I'm working on right now. Um, hopefully, inspire you to, to pick something to work on that will carry you through multiple days. Um, so, uh, I am a working photographer. Uh, I earn my living by being a photographer. I served in the United States Navy as a photographer. I was a ship's photographer, as a combat correspondent. I served with the uh, Navy's combat camera group embedded into Iraq and Afghanistan and stuff like that during that time frame. Uh, so I served for 24 years. I am fully broken and beat up and stuff like that. So let you know that Navy photography is a lot of fun, but it's also very hard on your body. So when you get old, and I'm, I'm, yes, I am now old at 55, um, it, you will pay for all those days with all that gear and carrying all that stuff. But I'm a big firm believer that you need to carry your gear if you're gonna make good images, okay? You know, the, you, you carry lenses, we carry gear, we have gear, it's, it's important. So um, when I got out of the Navy, I decided that I wanted to continue being a photographer. I did not wanna, I was already kinda of in middle management at the time when I got out of the Navy. Uh, I did not want to stay in middle management. I didn't want to take a job at, at some place where I was, you know, pushing papers and stuff like that. I was kind of done with that. Uh, and sometimes it's really kind of fun because uh, product photography actually does, has ha, the last three years of product photography has increased my portrait photography because it's all artificial light. You know, when you're working with product and you're shooting a watch or a pair of glasses or, or a, a camera or a, a, a bag or some food or something like that, um, it really is about using light and shadow, more importantly shadow, to tell your story about what the thing is that you want to say. Practice doesn't make, Vince Lombardi, practice doesn't make perfect, perfect practice makes perfect, okay? And sometimes you even have to practice at practicing, okay? Um, if I've got a day or two where I'm not actually working on a product or not working for a client or something like that, I set up and shoot something different. I may set up and shoot salt shakers, because I've got this, I've got a small collection of salt shakers. I've got some ceramic ones. I've got some clear ones. I've got, but I'll shoot them because they're difficult to shoot. They're hard to shoot and they're different. Sometimes I'll put an opaque one and a translucent one in the same shot and try to build light that lets you see that both of them have their own beautiful qualities about how light passes through glass or how light reflects or refracts or diffracts around something. You guys are, a lot of you guys are on the, on the, the cusp of learning about light and learning about what it does. And, and it is, it is so freaking cool. Light is so amazing. You know, is, is light a solid or is it a wavelength? What's that? It's both. It has principles of both. Photons are a solid. Okay, Part of, there's particulate in light and there's wavelength in light, color, red, green, blues, yada, yada, yada. So you get an opportunity. I think of, I think of light like, a, like water coming out of a fire hose. And I just take that fire hose and I put different nibs, you know, uh, different modifiers on the front of it, sometimes to fan light, sometimes to spray light very directly sometimes to spray the very tiniest, smallest amount of light, sometimes no light, <laughs> okay? Um, so light is a ton of fun to practice with or play with, okay? Um, for me, never tell your mentor, you, and, and also you guys should have a photo mentor, and you, you'll go through them, okay? They're like underwear. Eventually you will wear them out. So, so pick a mentor, utilize what you can learn from that mentor. Do not be afraid to say, hey, can you look at my pictures? Can you talk to me about what I'm shooting? Can we talk about light? Can we talk about this or that? Um, there, are, there are hundreds of really amazing photographers here in San Diego. And sometimes uh, be a member of a photo club and sit and chat with, uh, you know, the, both photo stores, I think. I know Nelson's, we just started up the new photo club or started it back up. So be a member of a photo club, pick a mentor, find somebody who's maybe just a little more senior, or, or does something that you like and you want to try that. Also, don't get pigeonholed. Don't only shoot portraits. Shoot this, shoot that, shoot this, shoot that, because this will help that, okay? 
I actually look at every portrait of the human face as the landscape of that human face. And I actually light the things as if it was naturally lit by landscape. Okay? So what I do is I go on location. I was inspired or told by my mentor that my portrait photography was a bit pedantic. You guys know what that means? Pedestrian. It was competent. It was lit. But there was nothing special about it. It was competent. It was lit. It was clean. There was a part that was in focus. There was parts that were out of focus. But there was no definition or rhyme or reason as to why. So he said, go work on it. Go get better. Okay? You have a stronger voice to tell about somebody. So he said, find somebody that you're interested in talking to because you're going to talk to these people a lot. Talk to them. Find out what makes that person special and then try to capture that moment with your lens selection and your body selection. And camera bodies are just, I love that we actually have a ton of different manufacturers here. I'm a firm believer that the camera that you have in your hand is the best camera you have. I, I, I really don't care what you shoot with, okay? Um, I have picked a, a, a single brand. I've shot many brands. I am currently a Nikon photographer. I love their gear. I love their glass and I love their portrait glass. I love what it does. And I've been a Nikon person for a long time that I don't care what you shoot. I care that you shoot. I want you to shoot. And you're going to hear it a million times. Well, you've got this thing. Okay. Let's not, it's not, it's not apples and oranges. It's not you know, it's a grain of sand versus the beach, okay? Carry your gear. Be a photographer, okay? Um, so I go on location. I wanted to meet people. I wanted to make interesting pictures of the people. I try really hard now to not say that I shoot people, and sometimes I cut off their heads, okay? So um, remember that yes moves a project forward. So, so for me, in picking a project, and I actually... If one is good, then two is better, right? And, and three will keep you super busy. Uh, so I currently have three portrait projects running right now that I'm currently shooting. Um, and, and it's great. I, I mean, I love, I love being this busy. I love being this inspired by the next person that I walk down the road and say, honestly, guys, there are 30 of you in the room and there's like at least 15 or 20 that I would love to take your picture. I'd love to get to meet you. I'd love to learn your story. You have a story. I'm sure you have a story because you just express yourself very creatively. There's a few people way in the back row that are not expressing themselves super loudly. No, I'm just teasing you sat in the back row. Um, but I, I love it. I love, I love human. I love the human face. I, I love how expressive it is and, and what it can tell us. So... Yes, moves a project forward. Don't be afraid in your project if somebody says, well, what do you want to do with this in the future? To have big goals. I had no idea that when my mentor said, go find the people you're interested in talking to, talk to them, learn a little bit about them, and make a more humanistic photo of that person, that it would ever be a print show. But in the first gallery, in the first group of people, so I wanted to photograph veterans. I wanted to photograph senior veterans. I actually decided, originally it was like, oh, I'm going to do veterans. And then I realized that that was a very broad brush. I mean, that was like pouring five-gallon paint buckets all over the world and, and hitting everything. So I decided to kind of pare it down through talking to my mentor. Um, and I decided that, hey, uh, World War II veterans are, are very expressive. There's a lot of stuff going on in their face. There are a lot of miles to capture photographically. Um, so I will do that. Well, where can I find veterans? Honestly, I live four blocks from a senior assisted living. I made some phone calls. I wrote a small little proposal letter, just a simple, hey, Mickey Strand Photography, I want to do this. It's not going to cost you anything. I'm actually even going to... I give a print to each client who sits down. It used to be an eight by 10, it's kind of grown. Now I actually give six, I give wall art now, okay? Because I've got some people that are helping me out with some of my expenses finally. Um, and so I give wall art now, okay? Because I, I, I'm one of those photographers who believes that it's not really a photograph until it hits the paper. Um, I, I, I'm not a big, you know, digital is cool and it gets the message out, but you know, I'm about, photos hitting paper, becoming prints and going on the wall and being seen. So 
Yes moves a project forward. Don't be afraid to say yes. Can you make prints? Could we do this? If, even if you're not a printer yet, you eventually will be a printer and you'll buy a printer and you'll, and you'll start making prints and then you'll decide that that printer is not big enough and you want, oh, well, welcome to Addiction 101. Uh, photography is, uh, is, is a great thing. It'll keep you off drugs because you can never afford them for how much the gear costs. Um, but honestly, there's, there's tons of opportunities out there. If you're not a printer yourself, there's a lot of people that can help you print. Okay, there's a lot of resources to help you print. Um, so I uh, photographed six, 16 veterans, 17 veterans, and then had a couple. So I'd made 18 prints that first day. And then we actually even had an open house. Okay, they said, well, could we put these up in our, they had a, like, kind of this little gallery space that they showed off art from the community. Um, and they helped pay for some frames so that we could actually hang them. I paid for the prints, they paid for the frames and we dropped a, a gallery show and we did it on Veterans Day to, to thank the veterans that, that had served, okay? And to talk about their stories. Um, be prepared for opportunities to come to you when you start working on stuff. When you start working on stuff and people like your stuff, then it's, it's yes helps you also. There'll be a lot of can you do. So I decided that this was fun. I enjoyed the show. I would do more. I looked for another resource. Where is another target rich environment that I'm going to find the people I want to talk about? If you want to talk about skateboarding and skateboarders, or you want to talk about music and uh, garage bands, or um, you know your friend's music group or whatever, and maybe the other music groups in San Diego, there's tons and tons of amazing artists, amazing musicians. And you could shoot if you wanted to do portraiture or if you wanted to do more environmental type stuff. There's tons of opportunities out there. Okay. Um, so I went and found the, there's a, a system called the Calvet Home System, which is a, a veteran's home for veterans who have served. Uh, we have a satellite of the Calvet system. There are like 17 of them. We have one in Chula Vista. Um, I called them up again, took that proposal letter, just wrote a really simple like, hey, my name is Mickey Strand and I, I work on this thing that really didn't have a name yet. Um, but I photograph veterans and I take their uh, picture after I talk to them for a while and then I print their picture and then I give them their picture. And, and I put them on my Facebook page at that point. Uh, it has grown to the point where it has its own website and it has its own funding. It has a bunch of other stuff, you know. Um, but the Calvet home eventually said yes. And sometimes you have to be tenacious. There's gonna be you know, this level, this level, this level. And with me, it was all about uh, how, what, do you, what do you want? What do you want from them? What, what is it gonna cost? And, and they're, they're, most people are not used to, I just wanna do something nice. You know? And photography can be your opportunity to just do something nice for somebody. If you've got a favorite band and you want to, or, you know, start with your friends, but if you've got a favorite band and you want to photograph music artists, or you've got a favorite artist and you want to capture the essence of that artist, that painter, that, that charcoalist, um, I want to eventually do something on taggers. I think tagging art and, and graffiti is incredibly beautiful. I think the process in it, to be able to think and work at this level when your canvas is that level and that you're actually working at the almost at the pixel level with a spray can when you're building these monster things you know how that brain works i, I kind of want to know about that because it's just it's really neat to be able to think about that so i went to the calvet home i found out that there were a lot more world war ii vets there than i anticipated and i photographed for three days so we set up in in different locations we photographed for three days i interviewed i talked to people i gathered interviews um, I used to take notes. I, I suck at that. So I now use my iPhone and extra batteries and um, I actually and bought a little microphone and I um, actually interview, keep their interviews on my iPhone so I can listen to their interviews and write my little storyettes about them. But I was able to photograph a bunch of them and they found money. They found money to cover some of the prints. Okay. They decided when we I showed off the prints and gave my prints to the people that were in the project, they decided they had money. And that show is actually still up like five years later. Okay. We're actually probably headed back to do some more at the Calvet system. Um, I've actually been to six different homes in the Calvet system now. 
I've been up to West Los Angeles. I've been out to Ventura. I've been, I've been all over the place. Um, yeah, so that two-month print show uh, is still actually hanging today. It wasn't planned on it, but they like it so much that they actually they bought a series of frames. I funded the frames originally. Um, they found money and funded the frames, and, and that stuff still sits up. So I was able to photograph a, a lot of amazing uh, heroes, guys that uh, were prisoners of war um, and served in concentration camps in Germany, shot down you know, broke both of his legs, you know, the, just, just some really incredible stories. Um, I worked with one guy, uh, Mr. Rodriguez, who told me a story about a, a combat story. We'll just leave it at that. And his daughter was there and um, sat in the back of the room crying as he told me this story, uh, you know, and it was, it was a pretty, it was a pretty sad, heartfelt, I think it's probably the first time in 70 years that he had shared that moment that he had experienced about saving one of his friend's lives and then having to take a life and, and how it affected him and stuff like that. Um, so it was really kind of neat to also be there for that moment for that human being and allow that human being before his passing to get that off of his chest a little bit. You know, At least that's the way I interpret it. That's, that's what I got out of it. Um, you'll meet some really incredible freaking people. I don't care who you decide to photograph, you will meet incredible people, okay? Don't say or don't miss an opportunity. That's what that slide, don't miss an opportunity. So um, Mr. Rodriguez gave me that amazing story. His daughter was in the back of the room. She had come that day to help get him dressed so he looked his best for the photo. And yes, I am going to take a, I am going to ask, can I get a picture of you and your dad, please? You know, and I'm going to clean that picture up and I'm just going to give it to them because because these these guys are really important to me and they move my project forward. Yes, moves projects forward. OK, uh, you will. Uh, I got invited to Ventura. I photographed uh, eight people up in Ventura, made some really pretty pieces, in my opinion. Uh, and you know what? That's another thing. Who cares if I like your work. Do you care? Please don't. It is rewarding when somebody tells you that's really pretty. It is rewarding. I'm not saying it is not rewarding. I'm not saying your skin doesn't crawl when good things happen. But if you like your work, you are your worst critic. If you like your work, like it. Just go with it. Okay? Just, just feel it. Uh, so I did a bunch of homes, went to a lot of places. In 2019, I had started amassing a collection. I think I was at 86 World War II veterans at that point. I had worked on the project for about two and a half, three years. I think it was three, three and a half, three and a half years at that point. I was still shooting. Um, and it was actually, it was probably four years at that point. So I was still shooting the project. 2019 was an active year of shooting. I actually had ended up having three different shows for Veterans Day, um, including I got invited to an actual museum. So now I had a collection of work, not just a couple of pictures, but I had a, a collection of work that actually could fill up an entire museum. Um, and it was really cool to have somebody say, hey, could you do this? Um, I was, I was very fortunate, again, find mentors that can help move your career forward and can put you in touch with important people in the industry. And honestly, we made some phone calls and said, hey, I can't afford five rolls of paper at $250 or $400 a roll. Um, but could you be my sponsor? You know, and we found a company who would be, Epson was, was kind enough to give me the paper to be able to print this show. And there is nothing like watching work that you've worked on, and 16 by 20 is about the largest I can print at home at that point in time. There's nothing like watching a 44 inch print come off of a printer and having work that's 35 by 44 and going, you know, holy cow. Watching your work come off a big, big printer is pretty cool. And I sat there for about 14 hours pulling prints off of that printer. Ate two meals at that sitting next to the printer. Okay. Uh, got invited into the museum. Uh, took two days to actually lay out the museum. Worked with another photographer who does a homeless veterans thing. And he had a section in the museum. And I had a, I had a very large section in the museum. 
And uh, I think I got a few more in there where, uh, and then we actually had a big open house and a bunch of people came and there was food and um, it was really kind of cool to have worked on a project that I loved and didn't mind working on and enjoyed it and brought it into fruition of actually having somebody call me up and say, hey, how many pieces do you have and how big could you print them and could they fill X amount of wall space? Because we'd like to, for Veterans Day, be able to feature you and your veterans. We love your work. We love your project. You know, And again, talk to people about your project. Talk to them about what you got going on. Have a special place maybe on your Facebook page or your Instagram page or your whatever, or have a separate Instagram page that's just that project so that you can show it off. There is nothing like walking through an actual museum and looking at the last five years, four years of your life and, and you know, the constant work and, and being able to go, these were, it was kind of funny. On the back wall, I had images from the very first um, shoot that I did and images that I had created a month ago. And they were sitting right next to the wall on each other. And I was like, I really sucked. I'm not that bad now, <laughs> you know? Uh, to be able to watch a five-year progression of, of your imagery and, and your collection, um, to be able to see that transition over your prints sitting, especially sitting al you know, almost life-size. Yeah, really, really very special day to be able to hang an entire show. Um, guys, that's a museum show from a goad, from a mentor who said, your portraiture's kind of pedantic. It's kind of pedestrian. It's competent, but I think you could do better. I think you've got something to say. Okay? Take that. Take that and run with that. Make that thing work. Work that program. Okay? Because sometimes when you work on a project, things happen. And then that makes something else happen. And that makes something else happen. And that makes something else happen. So this is the snowball that started up on Hill is I had these prints up on a, on a print show. Um, the Calvet home in, in Chula Vista asked if I could share a print for a veteran celebration for Hispanic Heritage Month. Um, I said, sure, so I shared the print. I said, what size do you need it? I'll make you a copy so that you can use it for your posters and for your you know, uh, flyers and handouts. What size do you need it? Do you need multiple sizes? I'm really just, resizing it and giving them a JPEG, you know, type deal. That's, it's not going to take me long. If they're going to share one of my prints and their type of deal, that'd be really cool. Well, there was a, a lady from the Union Tribune that went to that celebration and was like, God, that is really cool. And, and the lady said, oh, I know him. Do you want his information? And Pam said, well, should I call him? Absolutely. He'd love to talk to you about his project. His project's really cool. Come look at, and then she showed her the, the gallery that was in the, in the main hall. Um, so the Union Tribune came out, brought a photographer out. She came out. They watched me actually photograph uh, uh, Mr. Gonzalez. Uh, so we set it up so I was actually going to work in the studio. I photographed him, interviewed him. They took a bunch of pictures, and they put it out on the Sunday Union Tribune. And I got a full page on the Sunday Union Tribune. It's the biggest article I've ever had in my, in my career. It was really kind of cool. Uh, and this is uh, Joe, who sadly just passed away a couple weeks ago at 96 years old because he was in the 96th Infantry and he said he was going to make it to 96. He's a really neat guy. Really neat guy. Deaf as a doornail. We were, our interview is screaming at each other. It was, it was great. But he's a really, really neat guy. So... Union Tribune comes out, the LA Times picks up the article, 13 other newspapers pick up the article. Uh, you know, it's, it's close to Veterans Day. There's all this, you know, hey, that's a great human interest story. I end up on a lot of the around towns or people's sections or whatever in a bunch of newspapers and some magazines and stuff like that. The calls flood in. I, I'm overwhelmed. I'm barely able to keep up with emails. Somebody, a friend of mine, starts answering my emails from my website for me. And we built this huge spreadsheet. Uh, people around the San Diego area, LA area. Um, and I had just tons and tons of work. I still have probably 50 of those to get to in the LA area. I'm going up a couple weeks from now. That opens up another thing, Petapixel, which is one of the 
It used to be a cool uh, actual publication. Now it's an all online type of deal. But Petapixel, you guys, if you don't read Petapixel, subscribe to it, read it. It's got all the little things about what's going on in the industry, who's got what, what, what cameras are coming out, what's going on, news articles, things like that. It's, it's a really neat place. Whether you're into traditional or digital or whatever art, it's a really neat place. Um, it was really kind of cool to have them share an article on me. So me and um, Lewis got together and chatted, and then I wrote a bunch of stuff for him, copied some of my other stuff for him, and, and he wrote this lovely article, which I got an email and then a phone call from the producer at the Today Show. And the producer at the Today Show, she says, you know, I'm da 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 da, and I said, yeah, sure, right. Yeah, who, who actually are you? Because there's no way the Today Show is calling me, you know, to talk about my photography. Um, and she's like, no, really, I am, and sent me an email with her signature line. And so, yeah, I also IMDb'd her. I Googled her real quick to make sure that this was a reality and it wasn't one of my friends messing with me, you know, because sometimes friends are cruel, <laughs> you know, funny, okay? Um, but no, it was, she was the producer for Harry Smith and wanted to know if they could come out and photograph me photographing a veteran. I happened to have a couple scheduled for like two weeks from then. Um, it was just north of Camp Pendleton in a senior living facility. Uh, it was one guy, but then Polly became available. So I actually photographed um, a 98-year-old gentleman who served in uh, getting bombs from New York to France, made like 13 trips across the Atlantic and never got blown up. Um, and Polly, a 104-year-old uh, supply clerk that, that kept her unit together. So uh, Harry came out, we sat in the studio, he talked to me about the project. They built this lovely piece which came out on a Sunday Veterans uh, Memorial, actually it was that was towards Memorial Day. Uh, that flooded in, again, a huge amount of emails and phone calls and things like that. I actually built a Google map now of the 380 contacts I have around the United States that want me to come and photograph them. I just have to find money to be able to drive around the United States and photograph people because it's expensive to drag a whole studio gear with you. Um, I can set up pretty much anywhere, but it, it's expensive to drag all those bags. So we're kind of thinking of actually turning the project into an actual 501c so people can donate. And I can actually, you know, have, uh, um, you know, actually go out and keep, keep this project going, which I've thought was dead three times now. I thought I was done. I was going to move on to something else like three times now. And, and, and it just kind of keeps going. So the work continues. Uh, I keep shooting. I'm almost at about two. Actually, I think I'm over 200 World War II veterans. I think I'm at like 280 veterans. I've shot a bunch of Korean War and, and Vietnam guys right now. Um, the project has actually been more rewarding than I ever thought it was going to be. There's no way I really thought that this was going to, I was going to go and photograph and work on my portraiture, you know, and it's turned into almost a life calling. Um, so, uh, don't take pictures, be taken by the pictures that you want to create. Find something through your lens that, that forces you to pull the trigger a moment as somebody sharing something. Um, and, and they're talking to you about something. I actually, I actually photograph during the interview. I actually have a, tr a hand trigger and I sit in front of my camera. And when I'm sitting and chatting with somebody, if they get real animated and start talking with their hands and stuff like that, I've got my camera set on God bless facial follow focus. Uh, cause the camera will actually fo focus it. Once you lock it on an eye, it'll actually stay there as they're telling their story and getting all animated and you end up with some of this really cool images of people sitting and chatting and talking about their life. Okay. So that's it. That's, that's my project. I started the film consortium out of grad school in 2010 because I saw all the students that I was teaching not have opportunities outside of class to be able to collaborate and work on projects. And if there's one thing about film, it, the best way to get a, better a film is to make film. You can't really do it by sitting at home watching videos. You need to get out there and actually collaborate, network, make films, make bad films, make more bad films. Uh, and eventually grow your skill set to where you can make something spectacular with a group of other people. So I've taught all over San Diego, UCSD Extension, Platt College. I've taught at the Media Arts Center San Diego, the Team Producers Project, for 15 years. 
And uh, since 2015, I've been adjunct professor right here at San Diego City College in the RTVF department. Personally, I've made a lot of films. I've produced over 100 projects. That number has probably gone up since I wrote this. Uh, web series, short films, TV specials, documentaries, commercial projects, a uh, TV show for KPBS called Film in Diego. And what most recently I've been uh, working on is the San Diego Film Awards. The annual San Diego Film Awards was broadcast on KPBS uh, this year in June of 2023. So we started in 2012 at the Four Points by Sheraton. Uh, we recently had a networking event that reminded me of our very first networking event at the Four Points by Sheraton in 2012. We had it on Facebook for like two weeks and 200 people showed up. And uh, there was not a lot of promotion, but boy, did the word get out. And it really showed me how much need and interest there was in this community for opportunities to work in the film industry. So I founded it to grow our local film industry and to give more local opportunities in film for all of my students. A lot of my students at Platt and UCSD didn't have anything to do outside of class. They were working these low-wage jobs, and they had these incredible skills that they were, were sort of going to waste, except in the classroom. So the opportunity to give them opportunities outside of class was something that really uh, spoke to me. Our mission is to revitalize film, television, and new media production in the region. And we're doing that through increasing networking, employment, education, funding, and distribution opportunities. We also hold a lot of uh, educational workshops and work with a lot of different organizations in San Diego. So I'm going to talk about the different things that we have going on in San Diego. One is the San Diego Film Awards. I just confirmed the date for that. Uh, today, which will be the 24th of June. They'll broadcast on KPBS as well as we'll have an awards celebration at the Museum of Photographic Arts that same day. So it is an opportunity for people making films to submit their films and get recognized for their films. Typically, we have about 100 to 150 submissions, all local content, so everything that's been made in San Diego. And we uh, announce the nominations as well as the winners throughout the spring and early summer. So this is you know, awards are important. They're important for you to, to, to see how your work compares to other people. They're important for you to get something on your resume and something in your bio uh, that can help get you other opportunities. And the Film Awards was really created to see who the best uh, filmmakers were in this city and essentially provide an opportunity for them to be recognized and awarded. So it's a lot of fun. It's aired on KPBS from 2018 to present. And it's actually was nominated for an Emmy in last year's Emmy Pacific uh, Southwest Emmy Awards. So hoping this year we get nominated and win. Everybody take a quick prayer here for me and tell the Emmy gods that we need to win an Emmy this year. But uh, submissions are open up until tomorrow. They close tomorrow. So it's, it's open to all students, professional people making documentaries, narrative films, uh, both short and feature length. Then in the fall, we have San Diego Film Week. We launched that in 2017. And uh, it was a, in 2017, 27, 18, and 19, it was a, a 10 day long celebration of over 150 local, national, and international films. We pulled together films that were made here in San Diego, along with films made in Tijuana and Baja California. And we also included films from the many film festivals that are here in San Diego. Um, so we had selections from the San Diego International, Latino, Asian Film Festival, Horrible Imaginings Film Festival. Uh, there's up to 20 film festivals here in San Diego already. So uh, we also were able to broadcast our documentary selections on KPBS in the fall of 2022. And uh, we played selections from San Diego Film Week, the local screenings at the San Diego International Airport and San Diego International Film Festival. So there's an opportunity as well for you to submit your films, be seen, have an opportunity to screen your films, have a premiere locally, um, go out with your friends, family, and fans, and do red carpet and Q&As with the filmmakers. But the films submitted uh, that, are, that we choose can also go on and have much bigger, more international eyeballs on them, right? Through the San Diego International Film Festival and the San Diego International Airport. So we have our own KPBS channel called Film Consortium Television, Film Consortium TV. And uh, we do selections of the FilmCon TV. Uh, we do selections from Film Week on there as well. So all of these are just ways to get your film screened, ways to meet other filmmakers, opportunities to meet other filmmakers, uh, ways to grow your network, 
ways to grow your resume so that you can get bigger opportunities and better opportunities in this industry. We also do an, uh, a national, well, the last event we did was an international film challenge. Uh, we did the quarantine film challenge, and that was for films made in quarantine by people in their own homes, basically by themselves with their friends, family, and uh, we'll say their roommates and maybe neighbors. So we do different types of film challenges. These are usually meant to focus on certain groups or to give certain types of people opportunities to produce, direct, write films. And one, this is one of my favorite things that we do because some really phenomenal films, Emmy Award winning films have come out of this competition. In the past, we've done the Armed Forces Film Challenge, which worked with military veterans to produce military themed films. We did the Black Lives Matter Film Challenge, which uh, those films are about to air on KPBS. We did the Quarantine Film Challenge, which uh, over 1,100 submissions from 75 countries around the world during the quarantine. Uh, we got a ton of great content uh, that came through for that. And then the Her Film Challenge, my personal favorite, where women directors uh, uh, directed films written by women about local San Diego stories. So this is one of my favorite things that we do. And hopefully now with the pandemic going away, we're going to start it again this year. I mentioned this already, but we worked with a lot of great people in the community. San Diego International Film Festival is a big collaborator and supporter of ours, and they have a phenomenal international audience that we can bring our local films to. San Diego International Airport Arts Program, uh, we've been playing films on their 200 uh, screens across both terminals in the last couple of years, and under five minute films have the opportunity to play on their screens. So phenomenal opportunity for outside eyes to get to see our local films. The GI Film Festival San Diego, we've been involved with since inception, and we produce the local film showcase piece of that, meaning that we make sure that there are local films represented, there's local awards given out, local events during the festival. Uh, that's in collaboration with KPBS. And then KPBS is our biggest partner. We work with them on so many different things. Uh, another thing we do is the Explore Local Content Project, where we provide funding for local filmmakers to produce content for KPBS, whether it be web series, TV series, radio, web uh, podcasts, or documentaries. Woo. Just watching this tells me how I gotta, we gotta, we do way too much. <laughs> we also do classes. Of course, I'm a teacher, so I love to teach classes and I love to do workshops. And we've done a lot of workshops around San Diego with professional guests, uh, with really incredible guests, actually. Uh, we've done, spe had special guest instructors, Lisa Bruce, who's the Academy Award nominated uh, producer, Robert Nelson Jacobs, which is a Academy Award nominated writer, Brandy Shima Bakuru, who was, was our city of San Diego representative in film. So we have a lot of great instructors who we bring into our classes. And we've offered classes on editing, producing, cinematography, screenwriting, acting, web series, business, documentary filmmaking. So just something that is very dear to my heart is uh, teaching and education. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, so, you know, what I recommend getting involved with the Film Consortium, Film Week, Film Awards, you know, why? To learn new or, uh, or improve your skills is one of the reasons. To grow your resume and improve your job opportunities. To network with others. To get professional feedback. To get hands-on experience. All of those are reasons people join the film consortium and connect with our local industry. And I will say after three years of having awkward events because of the pandemic, the last event we had was very, very well attended and had a lot of excitement. A lot of new faces, a lot of old faces. And... It showed to me that the, the excitement for the film community in San Diego is alive and well after three years of whatever that was for us of awkward, <laughs> awkward live events. I mean, filmmaking is something you got to do live, live right, with other people. So it became very challenging to do during the last couple of years. Nelson Photo and Video. Where's Tony? Is he in here? We work with Nelson Photo and Video very closely, and uh, they partner with us on our, our workshops. And they give gift cards for anyone who attends. So they're a big sponsor and partner of ours. Panasonic Lumix as well, big sponsor and partner of ours that we've worked with for several years. 
And uh, that's it. That's the film consortium in a nutshell. It's important to, if you are interested in, in the creative, uh, collaborative art of filmmaking, it's important for you to work with others, meet others, learn different parts of the industry, create great work, and grow your career from there. And that's why the Film Consortium was created and we continue to do that in San Diego. Any questions? I know half of you missed most of this, but <laughs> yes. Oh yeah, we do volunteer. We do have volunteer opportunities at all of our events. We'll say that's the quick way to network into the community because you're there running the events. So you kind of meet everybody, you see everything. And it's much easier to connect in through our volunteer opportunities and sort of showing up at a networking event and trying to shake your hands to, to meet the people that you want to meet. But yeah, we have opportunities at all of our events. Our next one will be the Film Awards. Yeah. Any other questions? How can you collab? Huh? How can you collab with your team or something? How to collab? Yeah. Uh, the best way is to reach out and talk about like what we have coming up and see if there's a way, uh, there's opportunities uh, within what we're doing. Like for example, at San Diego Film Awards, we're filming the Film Awards, we're editing the Film Awards, we're creating a show, it's basically an hour long show for broadcast and we have a live event. So there's lots of different volunteer and uh, opportunities across that to do different pieces of it and to help us bring that together. And what's the best? That's a good, and um, Facebook is probably the best. Our email is the best. Email is really what we really on top of. There's so many different ways to communicate with people now. If we get Instagram messages or Facebook messages, we ask people to email us at filmconsd at gmail.com. Okay, that's good. Thank you. Yeah. That's it. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'd like to introduce our next, our next speaker, Michael Bulbanko from Fujifilm. He, Michael is a photographer, a video photographer, and a technical master that has been working with Fujifilm for 30 years, for over 30 years. He has a wealth of information, and Fuji is one of the pioneer companies in this industry. And so I'm really excited to hear about all the new things that are happening over, happening over at Fujifilm and some of the technical advice that Michael is going to give us. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for joining remotely. I'm Michael Bulbenko, I've been with the company, and you're ready for this, 32 years. Um, I have been a, been a professional commercial photographer and I've been in the movie business also going back to, I hate to say that the 1980s. So, um, but I'm going to show you something really cool. I think if you can see on my screen right now, something that we are uh, showing that's new, uh, it hasn't been released to the public yet, but there is something called Frame.io. Frame.io is a company that was developed for the movie business. Uh, for collaboration between on-set and editors and remote producers. And we are the first camera company in the world that has this direct camera to cloud upload um, from uh, a stills camera. So I just shot some pictures and if you see on the screen up here at the top, it says new files added. If I click on that, these are pictures, there they are. As you can see, those are shots. I, you just saw me shoot them a moment ago. Um, now there's video too. So somebody in the audience says, wait, is there video? Well, this is, look at that. Hang on, let me open that. This is video from this morning. Okay. Now. Okay. So what is it you can do with this? What was the purpose of all this? The purpose of all this is for very, very quick collaboration. A, you can have an editor that can actually be seeing all this and then can download the files as they're basically being shot because you can have uh, upload happening while you're shooting or immediately after. You can download the proxy files and start to edit while production is actually still happening on the set. You can get somebody that types in a comment. Like I can say here, I can say shaky, shaky shot, okay, which it was. I hit send, and if you look on the right-hand side, 
there's a comment, okay? Everybody in the project sees that comment. So you can have a dialogue back and forth. I can mark up this image. Let's say for some reason, I want to put a, I can put a circle right here, okay? I can send that, it's an annotation, there's another message. So whoever gets that, they can click on that message, you can see that annotation appearing on the screen. Um, it doesn't matter what size your screen is, it can be on their phone, it could be an app, it can be on you know, a big screen TV, the, the image scales, okay? So that is one of the new things that we're the first stills company in the world to have that. The movie, movie business has been doing this for several years and they have it by way of uh, transmitters that they attach to the back of the cameras to do that. We have this direct in the camera, okay? Um, it will be publicly released sometime around the NAB show, which is coming up uh, in the middle of April. And right now it only works with the Fujifilm X-H2 and the X-H2S cameras uh, and this file transmitter hand grip. There's plenty more information on the internet if you go to the fujifilm-x.com website or go to the frame.io um, and look it up. If you are a, a Creative Cloud subscriber, the Adobe Creative Cloud, you already have access to a free Frame.io account. Um, it won't give you camera uploads, but you can get in there and you can start dabbling with it yourself. You can upload from your desktop. Anyway, that's sort of the shape of the way things are moving in the business. Uh, you can imagine, especially if you're a stills photographer, you're doing a fashion shoot or a commercial shoot, and you have remote art directors or the owner of a company or something like that that is on the other side of the world, um, they can give you immediate feedback you know, uh, and, and or suggestions to help you as you're actually in production. For wedding photographers, you could be shooting a wedding, you can have you know, some relative, again, on the other side of the world that can't make it to the wedding. They can see the photos uploading in real time and they can download them themselves or they can type, type in something like, hey, I want a large print of this or something like that. So again, like I said, that is sort of uh, the shape of things to come. Um, trying to see, okay, I'm going to hide that. Uh, some of the things that I have done uh, personally, um, I, like I say, I shoot primarily a lot of music videos. This happens to be um, uh, uh, some just a, a, a movie that I shot about a year and a half ago. You can make a full-blown feature film for $10,000. That's what this film was. It was shot in five days, $10,000 on small $1,700 cameras. It wasn't even this one, it was a previous generation. I'm just saying that out there to, to all of you out there to encourage you, okay, that the tools that are available now, like these hybrid cameras, which I'm going to define, are able to give you complete motion picture, full, uh, broadcast ready and theater ready images right out of the camera. So um, what we make now in Fujifilm and most of the other manufacturers, uh, basically the, everybody makes good cameras. You can't buy a bad camera anymore. The things that set us apart, Fujifilm is the last four letters of our name, F-I-L-M. Uh, I'm not gonna go into that, but you can go on our website. What we have is we have built-in film simulations in our cameras that are actual, true mathematical reproductions of various film stocks. Um, it's fantastic. That is something, because we've been around since 1934. Um, we know how to do that, and that completely sets us apart from all the other camera manufacturers. Um, what is a hybrid camera? Well. So hopefully this will play. So I'm not going to show you the whole thing. This is a behind the scenes that I did for one of our photographers who was shooting uh, for one of the, a world class uh, motorcyclist named Robbie Madison, and that's one of the things that I do. All done with a small camera.
All right, just basically BTS stuff behind the scenes. Okay. Now, um, also, I do music videos. This was a music video that was shot just uh, about six months ago. Just to show you that I come from a cinema background, so my take is very movie-like. Um, I'm not a fast cuts kind of guy. Um, and this was a story about uh, that goes with the music is about a lady that has Alzheimer's. And um, the, the ending, I'm not gonna make you sit through the whole three minutes, but as you can see, what we're doing is, this is very, very full on professional production value. Again, done with very, very small, simple $1,500 cameras. Um, we make really, really great lenses as well. Um, yeah, I'm not gonna... All right, I'm not gonna make it. The color actually changes um, in the movie. So it starts out in this sort of very subdued, low key, low contrast, because we're sort of in the fogginess of her mind. Um, and then she sees a reflection of herself in the mirror. Um, I'll just give it another 10 seconds. You can see what we're doing here. When she walks away, watch it, watch what happens to this photograph. The photograph comes to life and that's her younger self. And now her younger self is going to introduce her back into her memories. All right, we'll stop there. Now, this I do commercial still photography. Uh, this is a very expensive uh, hypercar. And this is a screenshot off of Adobe Bridge. And if you can see what I'm enlarging, okay, is just the medallion off that car. And you can see how it's completely, totally sharp. So that's an incredible amount of magnification. Here's another camera, another car, I'm doing the same thing. So that is from one of our hybrid cameras. That is this right here. And you can see if I put my hand, it's just really the size of my hand. This is called the GFX 100S. And it is a 100 megapixel camera. And you can see how small and light it is. And it's a very, very large sensor. Yeah, you probably won't be able to make that out, those of you that are remote. This is a larger than full frame 35 millimeter sensor. It's a medium format in film language. And it's $6,000. But it does phenomenal video as well. So you can rig it out with uh, some of our small prime lenses. As you can see here, it's on a cage, it's hanging off of C-stands for some uh, live music broadcast. Here it is, tricked out with one of our uh, $40,000 pre-Mista cinema zoom lenses that we make. Um, here is that same thing built on a shoulder rig, so it's light enough to carry on your shoulder. It's a small body. Um, the lens is actually big. Here it is mounted on a Steadicam. So we do all of our internal marketing videos using this camera and lens setup. Um, you can look at them, they're online. You can find them on our website or on YouTube. Uh, it's a series of sitcoms that we make called All Sales Final. Uh, they take, they're about three minutes long and they take place at a mythical camera store. Um, but they're full blown cinema productions. They take several days to shoot. So. There's two different body styles of this camera. One is that smaller one that I held and you can see it on this. And then there's a larger one, the original one, the GFX 100, that came out about four years ago. They're the same sensor, the same processor, they differ in body style. So it is a system. Um, it, they have very, very high fast processors. They've got phenomenally good autofocus. So remember, you saw the size of that sensor. This is larger than full frame, okay? Um, the other cameras in that class either don't have autofocus at all or don't have it anywhere close to us. Um, we also do full-on 4K video internal, 4K 10-bit video internal and also through the HDMI out, which is like I showed you that we're using it. Uh, in cinema productions. So they are, there's $10,000 for the bigger body. There's $6,000 for the smaller one. Um, 
and you say, okay, Michael, uh, why are you, you know, I'm a, I'm a college kid. You know, why are you trying to sell me on a $6,000 camera? Well, um, I'll show you why. One of the things you can do with this, if you remember I said it was 100 megapixels, right? Um, so this was a video I did for a band right at right in early early 2021 and this was a, they had released a song that they were about to go and out and perform and this was right at the height of the pandemic the the covid pandemic so they couldn't perform all the venues shut down no restaurants were open bars weren't open they wanted to introduce this song and the song is called great distances and if you see so a cinematically we shot it green screen and the color changes from being subdued in black and white into color. But what I want to point out to you is the background. The background on all of these, which are which you call background plates, were all done with this 100 megapixel camera. And in particular, these shots that are going to be coming up shortly is I, I created this to design to look like you're actually actually driving, driving through the road. Um, let this catch up a second. Sorry? They're all in the same place. They're all shot uh, actually in my family room. Green screen was just set up there. Uh, they all came in one at a time because it was height of pandemic again. We couldn't have them together except for these two. Now look at the background. Do you see how it looks like you're actually driving? I mean, yeah, it's a little bit fake, but that was the idea is that we're traveling down these country roads. How do you do that? Well, you do that with having ultra high resolution. So by having 100 megapixels to shoot those, those background plates, when I bring that into the editor, okay, I can just keep zooming and zooming and zooming and zooming digitally without losing any quality because I have so much incredible resolution. So that is part of what I'm saying, see, about the hybrid world. So you can take stills and incorporate them into video at the same time. So you say, okay, Michael, again, the camera's too big, too expensive. I want something small and portable. So this is now where we get into our other cameras that are APS-C format, or in the movie world, they're known as Super 35. Uh, and for people, uh, you, those of you out there, the Super 35 uh, name refers to the, the cinema version of APS-C size, which is the film sensor. That size aperture, that film size has been the de facto film size for like the last 75 years. That is what the majority of uh, film cameras out there still are. Yes, there are 35 millimeter full frame cinema cameras on the market now, too, but they are new. The majority is still shot on APS-C Super 35, which is why we stick with that. Um, There's a couple of uh, BTS shots of that $10,000 movie that I made. Okay, I can show you that they're small, they're light, very easy to put on a gimbal, very easy to make a shoulder rig. So these cameras, these hybrid cameras, uh, are top of the lines. We have an H2S and an H2. Um, one is a 26 megapixel sensor. One is a 40 megapixel sensor. And the differences between them is not just in the resolution of the sensor, but the H2S, the 26 one, has a much faster sensor. It's what's called a stacked sensor. And the information is transported through that sensor much, much faster, which means the autofocus is way better. Um, and also there's something called the rolling shutter effect. I'll let you look that up. It's a thing that causes images to go tilted when you pan left and right. So it's not a good thing, but the stack sensor is much faster and it basically eliminates that. Um, and it will shoot uh, 6K in what's known as ProRes, which is a professional codec. The H2 camera, which is the higher resolution camera, will actually do 8K video in ProRes, but it's not as fast a sensor. So the H2S can actually do 120 frames per second in 4K, whereas the H2 will do only 60 frames per second in 4K. 
but it's capable of 8K in the other uh, aspect ratios and the other frame rates. They all have internal IBIS, in-body image stabilization. That's what IBIS stands for. We have up to seven stops worth of compensation. What that means is it's seven shutter speeds worth of stability. So if you had to shoot something at 500th of a second, but it's too dark to do that, Okay, you could drop five shutter speeds and the IBIS will still give you a sharp picture. Um, it can work with external recorders. The internal record time is two hours. So it's very easy to shoot an entire performance, a play uh, or anything like that without having to even cut. So uh, just literally a few days ago, um, I was at the 12 hours of Sebring race in Florida. It's an endurance race uh, shooting for a car company. And you ask, well, what do I need 120 frames per second? So that's what this is. 120 frames per second looks like this. We have a car that's doing 150 or 170. That's what having 120 frames per second is able to do for you. So you shoot at a much, much higher frame rate but you play it back at a regular frame rate. So the regular motion picture frame rate is 24. I shot it at 120, so that's basically five times slowdown, okay? That's one of the advantages, again, of having a hybrid camera that can do high frame rates and stuff like that. Now, you'll notice that the picture quality on that looks really yucky, okay? I'll explain why that, why that is in a few slides, but I left it yucky on purpose to prove to you that was straight out of camera. But I'll explain to you why that looks like that. So uh, the H2S, like I said, it does something called 6K, it does something called open gate. So you're used to seeing things on TV uh, and in theaters, on your phones, on the screens that are kind of a, a 16 by nine or a 17 by nine aspect ratio. So it's definitely wider than it is tall, okay? Open gate is actually more square. The term open gate means the entire sensor, not cropped in any way, shape, or form. So we have basically an almost squarish picture on the H2S at the 6.2 resolution. Uh, what that's good for is it gives you the ability to recrop in post production. Right? So if you shoot at open gate and you decide later that you want to frame it a little higher, or a little lower, a little more left or right, in post-production, you can recrop all that. It's also good when you're using something called anamorphic lenses. I'm going to ask you to look that up for those of you at home. Anamorphic is an older technology that basically takes the image and squeezes it left to right. Um, and it looks really weird and distorted, but it needs... A, a more square aspect ratio to capture in. So having open gate works better for anamorphic lenses. And then also we have two F-log tone curves. Okay, so that shot, this picture of the car, the reason that shot so flat, it's in something called F-log, Fujifilm log. Uh, every camera manufacturer has their own variety of log. Log stands for logarithmic. It is a tone curve. It's a way to extract basically almost the full maximum data of dynamic range off of your sensor. Uh, all television movie productions all record in log at the minimum. Some do record in video raw, okay? But having log in the camera, if you are gonna go into full-blown movie work, is really, really important. Because in our cameras, you can get 13, 14 stops, of over 14 stops of dynamic range. That's really important because if you make a mistake when you're on the set on a movie, all right, you don't want to be able, you don't want to ruin it because you can't go back and reshoot the movie, even if you're doing a wedding video, okay? So having log is really important. This slide shows you just how incredibly valuable this is. And this was our older log. This I created about two years ago before we had the second F log. Um, the camera this came off of was actually only 12 stops of dynamic range. But if you see, that is the waveform of me, of that image. I'm standing in bright, direct Southern California sunlight. I'm wearing a black hat and a pure white shirt. 
And if you look at the waveform, if you look at the top where it says 100, you'll see that none of that white exceeds 100. It's never clipped. And if you look at the black, the bottom part, none of the blacks are actually pure black. This means I have room to adjust the contrast pretty much as much as I want. That's the beauty of shooting long. And I know that's very, very technical, especially for some of you who haven't been in film schools yet, but I'm giving you a leg up. Okay, you say, hey, but uh, I want great autofocus, okay? Um, now, the movie industry lives absolutely 99% of the time on pure manual focus. They don't do autofocus unless they really, really have to, okay? It's all manual focus. They, they don't want any mistakes, right? You're paying actors millions and millions of dollars to be there, and you have crews of 100. You don't want things going wrong with, with autofocus. But for those of us that live in the indie world or are doing smaller productions, autofocus is phenomenal, especially if it works. So uh, hopefully, let's see, there we go. So this little video shows you our autofocus in action. We have subject detection. So it's eye and face and birds and planes and vehicles, okay? And you can see how it stays right locked on with the subject. So our autofocus is absolutely as good as anybody else's in the industry. Um, there are underwater housings available. There are these things called cinema cages available. Um, and that's just extra stuff that you can get. These aren't necessarily things you have to buy. You can, especially in underwater housing. So this was actually shot up in La Jolla. Uh, we did a surf video with one of our cameras and uh, you can rent those underwater housings. The cages are very, very useful. That lets you attach things that you saw in some of those earlier pictures. Now, we also have smaller, more compact cameras, uh, more retro design because we are, like I said, a film company. We have a, a film legacy about us. We have what are called the XT series of cameras. The XT5 is the newest. It has the same sensor as the XH2. Uh, it's a $1,700 camera. It does 6K video, does 40 megapixel stills. Um, but it's smaller and it's lighter. And again, if you, you know, look it up online for those of you that aren't here. Um, it's got retro knobs for changing shutter speed and ISO instead of wheels. Been very, very popular. We've had those cameras around now for 10 years. We keep evolving them. So we also make these very, very high end uh, cinema, compact cinema zooms. Now in the earlier photos you saw uh, on the shoulder rig and the one on a steady camera, very, very big uh, cine zooms that are about that big. They weigh close to 20 pounds. Uh, they're $40,000 lenses. They're full on, totally professional. But we also make some very affordable, accessible cine zooms called MKs and MKXs. Um, they are in the $4,000 price range and they come in the native mount for Fujifilm cameras called MKX, uh, which is what I had used on my movies. Um, they also come in the Sony E-mount, M4 thirds, and uh, by way of a dealer up in Los Angeles called Duclos Lenses, uh, they adapt it for Canon RF, that's the Canon mirrorless mount. So you can get these lenses in four different mounts. They're very, very lightweight. All right, I'll tell you how good they are. James Cameron, okay, had bought 20 of these lenses to use on Avatar, 20 of them. Um, they also, they were using them on the Sony Venice camera and what was called in the crop mode. But if they're sharp enough for Avatar, they should be sharp enough for you. That's what I say. Uh, they look like this when you put them in a cine rig and there's all the doodads and all the other stuff that you put on with that. Um, one last slide here I'm going to show you, and then I'll just uh, show you some quick things in an editing program. For those of you who are just getting started, this is what's called the timeline. This is the entire project of that uh, movie that I made. It's an hour and 40 minutes long. That long green bar that goes across the top, all the way from the left to the right, that's the video part of the project. 
What's all that stuff underneath? That's audio. So as you can see, there is, there's about 30 or 40 tracks of audio just for that little small indie film. And what that is is different microphones for all the different actors and it's sound effects and things like that. So for those of you getting into movie making, I'm going to tell you right now that the best and most incredible, the, the highest budget movie can be ruined if you have bad audio. So take classes in audio, learn how to do audio right, okay? Because it's definitely, definitely going to be really important for you. Um, and then we have uh, accessories, of course. Um, let me get out of that. And... Okay, we are now in a editing program called DaVinci Resolve. Uh, it is absolutely one of the top Hollywood post-production softwares that's been around for a long time. You can get it for free. Um, it's a bit complicated. It does have a steep learning curve. Uh, but if you are going to be serious about this, I'd say look into it because, again, you don't have to pay for it. There is a $300 pro version of it that gives you some additional tools, but you don't need that for most things. You can also get uh, Adobe Premiere Pro if you're on Creative Cloud. If you're not a Creative Cloud, you can download the Adobe Premiere Elements software, which has a different interface than Premiere Pro, but it does basically everything. And it's like $90 one-time purchase. If you're on a Mac, which I am, I've been on, uh, there's Final Cut. Final Cut is $300. It's a one-time purchase and you get upgrades forever. Uh, I've had Final Cut for over 15 years. Anyway, this is Resolve. And what I wanted to show you is something that uh, this is a project. These are some different projects that were shot um, in 8K. And what you can do with higher resolution is being able to punch in. So this is all single camera. This is just shot with one camera. It's locked off. And just like I showed you how to do the still plates, okay, um, you can, so these are some aerialists, um, and that's a close-up. And then I go back, that's the wide shot. So that's the master shot, shot in 8K. But all I need to do is I can create a pan. I can zoom in, and I can actually pan the image instead of panning the camera. So you see how I'm cutting back the, between the whole full wide 8K shot and the cropped in shots without losing any detail because the capture is much more, re much more resolution than the actual playback. Okay, that's all I have. I'm done, thank you for joining me. Go to fujifilm-x.com. A lot of the, the networks now, the major streamers, they require 4K. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you see that going up at any point soon? So, yes, um, definitely Netflix, Amazon, um, uh, Apple TV, you know, they, they do require 4K. The, well, I'll, I'll give the full answer is most of what people see at home these days, believe it or not, through cable and the streaming is actually HD. You may have a 4K TV, you may not be getting a 4K picture. Not only that, but they're also highly compressed, really, really compressed. But it works. And right, you're perfectly happy with it. But they do want you to acquire and deliver in 4K for future proof. Someday, all of that bandwidth for streaming and broadcast will catch up. It will be 4K. There probably won't be any HD. Now, honestly, if you're looking at it on an iPad, you're looking at on a phone, what do you need 4K for? You don't, okay? You totally don't. There's no benefit to it. But yes, the answer is, yeah. Is it going to be required to go to 8K or more? There are 8K cameras out. There are 12K cameras out. NHK, the broadcast network in Japan, all of the Summer Olympics in Tokyo were all recorded in 8K video. In Japan, you could watch it on eight, in 8K if you wanted to, but not in the rest of the world. So it's there, it exists, but the infrastructure to get it to your house is not there. Do we, 
like I said, the benefit of it is being able to repurpose your video. It's really, really cool to have an 8K video. And like I showed you, be able to punch in and recrop it in post. Um, it's one camera and you can basically get multiple looks out of it. So it's a choice that you, you can make. But any other questions? I hear an alarm. <laughs> <laughs> is George McDaniel, who is a ph photography instructor and sales <laughs> manager over at George's Camera. He knows everything about all the equipment, and there's so many exciting things happening at George's Camera. And let's give a warm welcome for <laughs> Mr. Larry McDaniel. Hey. Thank you, thank you. So am I on? Good? Sounds good? I can be heard. That's awesome. So I got my <clears throat> prop with me. So actually, my name is Larry McDaniel. I am the uh, educational coordinator for George's Camera. And one of my jobs, one of the things I get to do because it's fun, is put on a lot of educational programs. Uh, we have a lot of things coming up. Uh, if you go to our website, uh, www.georgescamera.com, check out our educational programs that we have coming up. A lot of them are vendor oriented. In other words, Canon, for instance, sponsors a lot of our programs. Uh, is this on uh, this image on right now? This, this one up there? Da da. Okay. We we have a lot of events and a lot of classes. We have a classroom at our Kearney Mesa store. The cool thing about being in the educational program is I not only get to instruct myself about how uh, the camera works, how photography works. Uh, help people understand the photographic process, but I get to help people increase their passion for photography. Uh, here at the City College right now, there's hundreds of students taking many, many, many classes so that they can become better and more proficient at the craft. And hopefully with the understanding of how the craft is done, how they, they can be really good at it, they increase their passion so they will continue on with this this the passion that they have to continue on with their photography. Uh, we offer uh, classes, like I said, and events. We have some events coming up this June. Uh, the one that's on the screen right now is one that's actually uh, from last year, but we have another one the end of June this year for the Scottish Highland Games. Canon will be there with us. Uh, we will be having cameras out to try out. If you wanted to try a camera out, try some lenses out, go out and shoot. We will have some challenges to get you outside and get you going at the game so that you can take some, some great pictures and then we'll have, uh, try out the equipment and play with it. Um, the Scottish Highland Games, by the way, in, in Bringle Terrace and Vista, it is the official games for the, the Highland athletes, for the pipers and bands, uh, for the dancers. And if you want something incredibly fun and really awesome to photograph, the sheepdog competitions are there. So we, we will be there. Also coming up at Del Mar Fair. Many of you are aware of Del Mar Fair, uh, the San Diego Fairgrounds. We have the international show. Uh, I will be presenting eight classes up there on Sunday afternoon, Sunday with Georges at Del Mar Fair. Uh, there's gonna be a lot of educational things going on there as well, but you get the opportunity to look at images from all over the world. See what's, what's going on. We, at Georges sponsor part of this and uh, help out with the judging and that kind of thing. There's also student showcase. This is where the college college classes, the high school co classes, photography students from all these schools present their work. Uh, great opportunity to take a look at those and see them. Uh, I can push the button right here. Also coming up with Canon, this is an opportunity if you want to get outside and really have some fun shooting some images, and again, Canon's gonna have a plethora, that's a good word, a bunch, a bunch of cameras and lenses out there to play with. And you're gonna to get to try them out. You're gonna have the experts there to help you understand how they work and what you can do with them. We're gonna have macro shots. We're gonna have models out there to shoot, wedding type of, type of images, and uh, what we call flying dress. You have to come out there and see it. But this is gonna be at the flower fields, the Carlsbad flower fields. That's where you sign up for this one. Uh, not on the George's website. And go out there and uh, Canon will be out there, George's will be out there, and our models will be out there. So go out there and play and have some fun with some great equipment. 
the day before this, that's on April 16th, Sunday afternoon. The day before that, Madison from Canon is going to be in our classroom in the store. You're going to have two classes that day. One's going to be uh, the uh, basic class on how to use the cameras, how to understand the cameras, at the workshop on that. And then following that, let's see if that's on there. That's flower fields again. I don't know what that, <laughs> do we have that on there? Uh, there's the flower fields again. But she's also going to be doing a class on macro photography, close up photography. What's macro? Um, Again, there'll be a class on that, and then that Sunday we'll be uh, having the, the program out there at the flower fields. Hanson Fawn, Google him. If you don't know who Hanson Fawn is, who, who he, he has been for a long time, one of the Canon Pro shooters. He's also a professional photographer. You want to learn from the best? Come see the best. And we will have him in our, our store one day. And if you go on to uh, PPSDC's website, you will see information on this, and you will also see that they're having a special program shortly after that, the next day. Ah, there's a picture of Madison. Madison uh, Hood from Canon will be presenting the macro class again on that Saturday. A great opportunity. Number one, you get to look at lenses, you get to see what really works for close-up photography. It's not all about taking pictures of bugs on flowers. Understand how, how one-to-one -one ratio works understand how flat field works. Uh, she'll be going all over this so that you can understand how to be more proficient with your, your macro photography. And then here's the street photography. When is that gonna be, Madison? That's coming up. Um, yeah, that's coming up also. But we have a number of things. So I'm gonna leave that one up just for fun. Anyway, at George's camera, we, we, we handle all the cameras. We have... Um, the full array of Canon, Nikon, Sony, Leica, all of those, uh, Fuji. We have Tamron lenses, we have Sigma lenses. That's the equipment. The fun thing that we want to help people out with is again, to maintain, to grow that passion that you have for photography. And sure, we work with a lot of professionals. We know a lot of the professionals. Uh, I do studio consulting, so I get to go in the studios and talk to some of these people. But the really fun thing is seeing people who are maybe considered to be an amateur, considered to be a beginner, and watch their, 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 their passion for this craft, for this photography art, really start to grow and, and keep on growing. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, give, please give me a call. Email me at Larry at George's uh, Come in and see us at the store. We got two stores, one in North Park and one in Kearney Mesa, the newest one. We've been around for 59 years now. So come in and see us. If you got any questions on any camera gear, uh, sound gear, uh, any of that kind of thing, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, we also have a fantastic rental department. Um, probably something that a lot of students aren't gonna get involved with. We do have student discounts with some of that stuff, but rental department, we get people coming in from Chicago, from New York, and they are professional photographers. They need grip equipment. They need camera equipment to do a shoot here in San Diego. And we have it for them. That's the largest uh, rental, de rental department in uh, San Diego County. Uh, we have that kind of thing. So again, that's a great opportunity. If you want to rent something, try it out. See how it works for you. See if it's going to work for you. And then from that point on, you can decide whether you want to purchase or make it part of your gear. I like to tell students that the gear you have, the understanding of the equipment that you have, the programs that are on the camera, these are all tools. They're like paint brushes. And I like my students to understand that they are artists. They're artists painting with light. You're creating an image with light. Your first image is painted into the camera. Your final image should be on a print on your wall. Your wall is designed to be a gallery. It should be full of your images. You should have your images up there. But you're painting with light, so you are an artist. All these tools, all these features in the cameras, all the modes, all the functions, they are all paint brushes. The more proficient you become as an artist, you'll, ne you'll know whether to pick up a palette knife, a broad brush, a thin brush, 
You'll know what they do. You know how they work so you can paint your pictures. Okay. Come see me at the store. Am I good for time? Or you need to go on? Okay. But thank you. Appreciate your time. Bye-bye. Hi, everyone. I am so excited to bring our next speaker to you. She has a wealth of knowledge. She has been doing photography for over 40 years. Her name is Lois Fong Sakai. She is the Senior Program Coordinator of the San Diego County Fair Photo Competition. So you are going to learn so much from her. Let's give it up for Lois Fong Sakai. Thank you very much, everybody. And it's a pleasure to be here today. Just want to give you a little bit of background. The San Diego County Fair's International Exhibition of Photography is the oldest and the largest juried competition in all of Northern California. So we typically get over 3,000 pictures and it originated here in San Diego County at our very, very famous Balboa Park. So it started back in the 1940s when the U.S. Navy ran the International Exhibition of Photography out of what is still the Photographic Arts Building. And because it was run by the Navy and the sailors, a lot of the photos that were entered came from Asia, from Europe, North America, Central America, South America, all over the world. And to this day, it is still the international competition because we have people that fly in from all over the world to enjoy our photo competition and to enter the photo competition. So we typically have over 4,000 pictures that are entered in the fair. So before the pandemic, we had about 4,500 entries, over 4,500 entries, and we have the ability to hang about 1,200 of the pictures in our gallery. So these are some of the categories that we have. We have 34 different categories. So for most pictures that you take that you might consider to enter, we should have a category for you. We start with the seasons, spring, summer, fall, and winter. We have a new category this year. Class five, which is timeless, which is seasonal, um, non-seasonal landscape pictures. So that could be pictures like forests or deserts that don't depict a specific season. We've got waterscapes, formal pictures of people, informal pictures, flowers, plants and trees, mammals. Our biggest category and most popular is cell phone category. And cell phones, I love having cell phone photography because it's really the gateway to introducing everybody to photography. And the best camera that you can have is the one that you have with you. And pretty much everyone's carrying a cell phone these days, right? So our other categories, black and white, we have one that you may be familiar with, documentary. So that's something that's going to be like street photography or a photo that tells a story. Typically with documentary pictures, you can do in processing the same sort of things that you would do if you were in a traditional darkroom. So you can dodge, you can burn, which means you can make parts of the picture darker or lighter. You can crop the picture. You can put a vignette on it. What you cannot do with documentary or photojournalism pictures is move anything, take it away or add anything in because that truly is exactly as it's supposed to be. So new this year also, we have our fair theme, which is San Diego County Fair, which is get out there. As we're coming out of the pandemic, think about what getting out there may be. It could be reuniting with your friends, it could be traveling, it could be going to parties, going to concerts. At the fair, they're gonna decorate with themes of camping, going out to national parks. But what is your definition of get out there? So think about that, and if you're interested in entering, go ahead and do so. This is the rest of our categories. So we do have still film and alternative process, which I remember when a few years ago, we had a small category called digital photography. 
and traditional photographers that use film were so incredibly upset that we had digital photography. Now, when we think of pictures, probably 90, 95% of our images that are entered are all digital phot photos now. So we have a very small percentage of pictures that are film and alternative process. It could be slides, it could be scanned pictures that are manipulated, Polaroid pictures, but it still holds a very near and dear place in my heart. And so as to pay tribute to the beginnings of photography, we still have film and alternative process. So class 33, digital photographic art, is when you have pictures that you have taken, but you put the pictures together to composite, to make an entirely new story. So what is story would you like to take? Now, what we are requiring this year is that if you do enter this category, that when you enter in tier one, that you enter a collage, not only with the main picture that has all of the story that you want to the judges to take a look at, but please include the thumbnails along the edge so that the judges can see what you start it with. And one of the fan favorites is the large print category. So with large prints, these are pictures that would be larger than our traditional 16 by 20 finished product that's ready to hang in the gallery. And you can go up to 40 by 40 inches. Now, print category, the large print category, is an open category, so you don't have to shoot for a specific theme. So if you have a big panoramic picture or something that doesn't necessarily fit in the other categories, if your file size will allow you to print, go ahead and consider making that as a large print. So it has a really big wow factor. So this is kind of a summary as to the new things in the fair this year. Um, another thing is float mounts, where your float is away from the wall. Those are not going to be allowed anymore. We just have to have the submitted images in print be completely flat on the back. And the reason for that is because we adhere all of the images to the wall using Velcro. We do have a weight limit of seven pounds this year, and that's to make sure that your prints remain secure on the wall, since we're only adhering your prints to the wall using Velcro on the back. I know there's been a lot of talk about artificial intelligence work now, AI-generated work, such as mid-journey and other things. All photography and images that you use to make your images must be generated by you. And we do reserve the right to ask for your original source files. So if you're interested in entering the fair, go to our website. So that's sdfair.com and look at the categories. Read the 34 categories that we have and see whether you have images that fit those categories. So not every picture that you like, that you want to enter, might fit squarely into a category. So take that into consideration. If you have a picture that you took in the summer from Iceland and there's got snow in it, please do not enter that in summer. So go ahead and continue to enter that in winter because we still associate snow with winter. So enter by the deadline. Our deadline this year is Monday, April 17th at 11.59. Please don't wait until the last minute because if you have any problems or questions, it's gonna be a challenge. We're not gonna be able to answer questions for you at midnight at the deadline. Our judging is completely blind, which means the judges do not know who the makers of the photos are. So please, please, please do not put watermarks on your images, either digitally for tier one or for tier two in printed form. There's got to be no signatures on your images or your mats or your, so that we can have a completely blind judging. Um, for tier one submittal, your pictures could be up to five or six mags. We suggest that 1800 pixels horizontally or 1200 pixels vertically so that the judges can look at your pictures. If the pictures are larger than that, you're gonna have difficulty uploading and our software is not gonna support that. And very important, once you have submitted, make sure that you save your email confirmation so that if you have any questions or problems, we can refer to that very quickly and solve your questions. For tier one, all of the judging is done on computer monitors. So the day before judging, 
we have a room set up with a series of computer monitors. All of the computer monitors are calibrated to a color temperature of 6,000, gamma of 2.2, and a brightness of 110 lumen. So if you calibrate your computer screens to these specifications, you will be looking at a screen that's similar to what our judges are looking at. If your pictures are selected after tier one to be delivered for tier two judging, you'll get an email and instructions as to how to prepare your prints for delivery and for judging. So in the entry material, when you go to sdfair.com, you can take a look at that. You can have the images your prints ready to hang and judge, delivered by US mail or FedEx or however you'd like to have it sent in. As soon as you get the letter, up until delivery date. If you wanna have it returned to you, please include prepaid postage so we can get it back in the box and send back to you. And then pickup is gonna be on July 6th to return your pictures to you. So how do you pick a picture that's for competition? I mean, certainly we all take pictures for memory pictures, to remember something, to remember an emotion. But for a competition, you may have to kind of go outside of your traditional box to figure out what you want to enter. So important elements of a picture are, how does the picture make you feel? What's your initial reaction? Does that does your picture have impact or a wow factor? If a picture makes you feel something, if it makes you feel joyful, makes you question, makes you sad, if it elicits a feeling or an emotion, that picture probably has impact or certain wow factor that makes you want to look at that picture again or ask other questions. That's really, really important. Does your picture have a clear and succinct focal point? So the late Professor David King, who used to work here at City College, used to say, there's a picture in there somewhere, but it's not my job to find it for you. Cropping and telling your story as to what you want the viewer to see are extremely, extremely important. You want, don't want to leave it up to chance as to what you want your picture to say. You want to make it clear to the person walking through the gallery that's looking at your picture exactly what you're trying to get them to see. So you need to have a clear focal point and the composition will help you with that. Is the photograph well lit so that what you want the viewer to see is clearly identifiable? Is it lighter than others? You don't wanna have something that's a distraction brighter than what you want them to see. Is your pro photograph properly exposed? If you have a landscape, do those colors exist in nature? If you have a picture of a human being, does that picture, does the photograph of the skin look as it should be? Or do they look too blue? Do they look green? If they look green, do you want them to look sick? Is that on purpose? So are the skin tones, are the colors appropriate? Now, there are photographs and there are lenses where people can shoot for pictures that are out of focus on purpose. Abstract photos can do that. But unless you are trying to create a photo that is not sharp and that is not in focus on purpose, be sure that you are able to show with sharpness and focus what is supposed to be the subject in your photograph. And we've spoken a little bit about color and tone. Super saturation tends to be something that a lot of people do, but just because you can push the slider all the way to 100% for saturation doesn't mean that you should. Sometimes a little restrained and pulling the sliders the other way or pulling it back a little bit can make your picture have a bigger impact. So common issues that we see during judging is that photographs don't have that wow factor, don't tell the story. It's not clear what the viewer is supposed to be looking at. Do you have detail in your shadows so that it's not completely black? 
if you have whites or something that's bright, can, are you able to see some detail in the areas that are white? Can you pull that back? Um, Over-processing your pictures can cause um, crunchiness in pictures or loss of detail. And excessive saturation can also be difficult because sometimes the colors are uh, out of gamut and or the colors end up being so unrealistic that some judges may be turned off by it. One of the easiest things you can do with the photograph is to make sure that your horizon lines are straight. So you have a picture of a landscape or the ocean, unless you're intentionally trying to do a Dutch horizon line where it's at this weird angle because you want to create a sense of uneasiness with the viewer, it just takes a few seconds, go in to Lightroom or Photoshop and straighten out that horizon line. Loose cropping, that's a situation again where you may have a photograph there somewhere, but you've got too many stories and distractions. So if you tighten up the crop of the picture, you may have a more powerful picture. If you have things that are brighter or of color on the side that are pulling the viewer's eye away from what you want them to be looking at, is there a way for you to crop the picture or to take that out so that it doesn't become a distraction and compete against the story that you're trying to tell in your photograph? Another challenge that we've seen is sometimes just because you can print a picture larger doesn't mean that you should. And one of the reasons that you should not just make everything a big picture is because your file size may not hold up. So if you have a small file size and it doesn't translate well to a big picture, it can be really powerful to make a smaller picture. Just put it inside the big mat that we require of 16 by 20. I have seen award-winning photos that have been like four to four, five to five inch square that have been more powerful because a small picture forces someone going up to go up to your picture and really pay attention to it. So bigger pictures are not always better. And you take so much time in selecting your gear and going out to a location to take a picture. Make sure you spend the same amount of time, if not more, in processing your picture, printing your picture to make sure that it looks good deciding the type of paper or substrate you want to print it on, and then mounting your picture so it looks good. So as I said, a proper printing on your pictures on a proper medium is really, really important. So what I like to do is if there's a picture I like, I print it out on several different papers or substrates. So take the same picture, print it on a glossy paper, print it on a chrome paper, print it on something that's an art paper, do something that is, you may be an antique -y looking type paper or a metal on a canvas. I think you'll be surprised at how the same image will look different on different materials. So once you get the pictures back, See if you like the way they look. Do you need to make the pictures brighter? Do you need to make them darker? Which one has the feel that you like? Reprocess your pictures as necessary and then repeat the process by printing again. And you can get small pictures printed to kind of use as a test to find out what your picture is going to look like before you print a big picture and spend all that money. So you can print on any size, on any type of material. They can be paper, metal, acrylic, canvas. Um, so long as they're going to be capable of being hung to our wall if we just put Velcro on the back of the picture. They can be any size up to 16 by 20. So this is the 16 by 20. Inside of it, the picture can be 16 by 20, or it can be smaller than with a mat in front of it, and the front mat will protect your image. Now the front mat must be either white 
or black. And when I say white, it's paper white, not ivory, not snow white, which is blue. And when I say black, it's just black. Now, the core of either one can be white or black, but the mats must be white and black only. So any other color mats will disqualify your image. And then the images, once they're accepted into tier two for delivery, you have an email sent to you with this label. So this label you'll put on the back of your image in the same direction that your picture is to be hung. And once again, no names, signatures, or watermarks to make sure that we do have a truly blind judging. So what you wanna do when you have a picture that's to be delivered, you need to have a front window mat, you need an image, and then you need a backboard. Backboard can be a foam core, or it could be a matte material. You need some tape. And when I say tape, I prefer artist tape just because it's very thin and it works really securely. And you need a double-sided tape. So please don't use masking tape or scotch tape. Scotch tape will tear and masking tape, it doesn't do well with the changing temperature and humidity in our gallery. Your front mat and the black mat must be the same size of 16 by 20. So these are the directions of how you'll do your matting. And I do that half that with the entry material. And when you put it on, you'll wanna put it on the backboard. The reason that we have it hanging like this is that if for any reason the front mat comes off, since the front mat will be held only with double stick tape, if this falls to the floor, then this picture will still be on the wall and it won't get damaged. So these are the directions as to how to do that. And it is, again, with our entry material. And these are common problems that we've seen in the gallery um, as a result of improper matting and presentation. So the photograph on the left there, the person used masking tape. And so it didn't stay together. In the one on the right, instead of the photograph being put on the backboard, the photographer put it on the front mat board. And when the front mat board popped off because they didn't use enough double stick tape, it took the artwork worth it. And that can cause a problem of um, the prints getting damaged. A really sharp blade is important when you're cutting a mat. So you want to make sure that a sh with the sharp blade, you don't get these weird, I call it gidgy gidgies, but rough edges when you cut your mat boards. And here again, it was blades that were not cut. And so it ended up with a really rough edge and the mat board in the back, instead of having the picture square behind the picture, it was set at an angle, the picture was set at an angle. And so it's peeking out from behind the front mat board. This one, the picture was not square within the backboard. They didn't have a front mat, which isn't a problem, but with the presentation, when the picture is at a weird angle and it's not covered up by something in front to make it look like it's still level, um, it's not a very professional presentation when everything's weird. So we only allow single mats. So this presentation has a couple of issues. One is that it's got two mats. It's got a black white and a white mat. And I don't think you can really tell, but in this picture, the white mat isn't white. It's actually ivory. So here again, the print was not square and there's a knife slip and this edge is not straight. 
Oh, this picture, I remember it coming in. Um, during judging, the judges called me over and there was a photograph that the judges liked, but unfortunately somebody stepped on the front mat be before they delivered it to us. So there was a waffle pattern of the bottom of a tennis shoe that was on the mat that was delivered. And unfortunately, the judges did not allow this to go through. Now, if you're putting a picture in a frame, a lot of times people will use photo corners. The only problem with using photo corners at the San Diego County Fair's photo exhibit is that our temperature and humidity change drastically throughout the run of the show. So what happens is that with these photo corners, it doesn't allow your picture to expand and contract. And when that happens, your picture will kind of expand inside of the photo corner and it'll cause some pressure and that front mat will pop right off. So, and that's another reason why we suggest that you do your print like this is so your picture can actually expand and contract behind the mat. Um, this one, the picture, the image was dropped on its corner before it was delivered and so it was damaged. And it's kind of hard to tell here, but the double stick tape that's used to put the front mat on the backboard has a several bubbles in it. And when the temperature and humidity in our room changes, those bubbles will pop up and it causes that front mat to fall off again also. So we spend a lot of time fixing mats all the time. Um, so we don't allow float mats anymore, but what happened here is that somebody printed a smaller than 16 by 20 acrylic print and they really didn't want to print it again to the size of what our requirements are. So they made a float mount and they double stick taped the float mount to the back of their acrylic mount. So I know that they tried to make it work, but to truth be said, there's no amount of double stick tape that's going to hold the weight of an acrylic mount. So I do not recommend this. So this is a behind the scenes look of our tier one judging. All the judges, we have 36 to 39 judges every single year. They work in teams of three. We assign them based on their expertise. So photojournalism um, photographers will be, um, their Pulitzer nominated, their Pulitzer winning photojournalists, and they'll be judging documentary as well as other categories. If someone's a wedding photographer or a portrait photographer, they'll be doing, looking at photos of people. Um, we have photographers that were the lead photographers at the San Diego Zoo and the Wild Animal Park. So they'll be looking at mammals and birds and other wildlife. So these are the, some of the things that the judges are looking at. And we've talked about some of those already. Um, I want to stress here also that creativity is a big is a big part of shows also. We get a lot of pictures of the beach and of piers here in San Diego. But what makes a picture more likely to be hung in our gallery or any art show is that is there something different about that picture? Has someone else not done that before? So this more pictures of tier one. And yes, that is a judge holding a magnifying glass up to the screen to look at the details. And sometimes we have during tier two, when they're looking at printed images, it's very often that they'll take their cell phones out with the flashlight on and get really up close to look at the pictures to see how they look in print. So this is tier two judging. We handle your prints all with white kid gloves because we want to make sure that we don't get them dirty and we don't have the oils on our hands that transfer to your picture. So the handlers will take the picture, show it to the judges. They can move them closer, further away. If the judges want to know the title, they'll read the title. They can tilt it so that they don't get the glare off the lights. And then that's where they decide whether a picture will hang in the show or whether it wins a ribbon and money. This is what our gallery looks like when we first get it. This is what it looks like during tier two intake, where the, 
the photographers come in with your pictures. We check them in. And right here, we have templates on the table where we check the sizes to make sure that they adhere to our 16 by 20 or up to 40 by 40 for large prints. All of the first place winners of our 34 categories are set on a table. Each judge gets one card. They walk around the table and they look at all of the cards. They put the one card down on the picture that they think deserves to be the best in show. So we've had the best in show be selected anywhere from three votes all the way up to 13 rounds of voting. We had one year where the runner up for best in show did not win by one vote. And interestingly enough, we, we have something in our gallery called the People's Choice Award. The winner of the People's Choice Award was the runner up for the best in show that year. So these are our judges along with our student volunteers. All of these are high school students that volunteered for us last year. And we encouraged the students who were photography teacher students to talk to the photography, our judges, to learn from each other. And it was just great synergy in the room. On the left, some of our photo crew are putting the thousands of thousands of people pieces of Velcro on the back of the pictures to adhere them to our walls. And the right is what the gallery looks like the night of the artist reception, which is the evening just before the fair opens to the public. So these are critical dates this year. So entry deadline is going to be April 17th at 11.59 p.m. You'll be notified by April 26th as to whether your picture should be delivered in print. The delivery dates are May 15th and 16th. We have the artist reception on June 6th from 7 to 9. And that's the, the big reveal of the gallery. And that's when everyone will find out how their pictures did during tier two judging. And then return of the pictures will be on July 6th from noon to seven. If you're unable to make the pickup yourself, you can give your claim checks to a trusted friend and they can pick it up for you. Or if you made arrangements with us to have it shipped back to you, then we'll put it back in the box in your postage, prepaid postage box. So this is a picture from last year of the artist's reception. And these are critical dates and educational opportunities. I really like to point out that the judges roundtable and critique are great resources. No other photo competition gives you access to the judges like the San Diego County Fair. For the price of a ticket, price of admission, you have access to talk to the judges, meet them during the judges roundtable, where they will talk about their process, what they were looking for, and what they judged. The very next week on Saturday, June 17th, we have the judges critique, where you can bring in images, perhaps that were not accepted, or other images that you have on a USB, on an iPad. The judges will give you feedback as to how you can improve those pictures. And this is a true story. A few years ago, we had a lady, she was brand new to photography. She entered 10 photographs. None of the pictures made it into the photo gallery. She went to the judges critique, talked to several of the judges, took their comments to heart, learned how to process the pictures, the next year, she re-entered all 10 pictures. All 10 of them made it into the photo gallery. Several of them won money and awards. We have two fun opportunities at, with our photo shootouts. So on Sunday, June 18th, which is Father's Day, and the Sunday after on the 25th. And that's where you can bring a cell phone or a digital camera. At the appointed time, we give you a theme. You have 90 minutes to two hours to run around the fair to shoot for the theme that we give you. When you come back, you give us your one picture. We will have live judging and cash awards for the winners of the photo shootout. And with registering for it, it is you must pre-register. You get one ticket to participate at the fair for that day. So that's a ticket to go in. So that pays for itself already. Photo shootout is just a bonus after, on top of that. And every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, we do have photo workshops. 
Um, we have some very, very special guests this year. We have Eric Joseph, who is renowned um, photographer that specializes in printing. He's doing two days of workshops on printing with different medium. And he's actually bringing printers on a ton of different papers. And several lucky participants will have the opportunity to win for him to print your picture on several different medium. He's doing that workshop somewhere else. He's charging $2,000 for that. It's going to be free to our fair entrance. We also will have Les and Mary Anderson coming, and they're going to do two workshops. One is going to be on shooting the solar eclipse. And why is this important now? In October of this year, and also in April of next year, we have two solar eclipses. So they're going to tell you what you need to know about safely shooting the solar eclipses. They're also going to be doing a presentation on how to shoot and search for the Aurora Borealis. So Northern Lights, solar eclipse, learning how to print, great, great opportunities. I, and people do pay hundreds and thousands of dollars for these workshops. We're giving them to you for free. Just come to the fair, spend the day there, eat a bit of food, and learn a lot about photography. If you want to get more information on what's going on at the fair at the latest news, we've got a QR code. So you can follow us on Instagram and on Facebook. So I've got several winners here of pictures from last year. So I'll go ahead and get that queued up. All right, everybody, that concludes the presentation. If you do have any questions, feel free to email us at the fair um, at entry at sdfair.com. Thank you very much for your attention and good luck to all the entrants. Matthew Sutherland is a Panasonic Lumix ambassador and the owner of Matrimony Films, a cinematic production company based in Southern California that specializes in event and corporate film production. Matthew is a graduate of UCLA's 
School of Theater, Film, and Television. And he has had a successful career, both in front of and behind the camera, for over 18 years. Matthew has been a member of the Panasonic Lumix Ambassador Team for the past five years and is a Stella Pro Champion of Light. He loves promoting their cinematic camera gear and teaching filmmaking workshops all over the world. Let's give a warm welcome for Matthew Sutherland. Yeah. Thank you so much. Of course. Oh, that was fantastic. Thank you. Wow, she's good. Thank you. you could be an actress. All right, let's talk about filmmaking. So I'm going to talk to you about filmmaking through uh, Panasonic Lumix. Um, like she said, I've been an ambassador for over five years, and I've actually used Panasonic's gear as a filmmaker for over 15 years myself. Uh, and then, you know, over the years, I've made a relationship with Panasonic because it's gear that I love, I trust, and I use all the time for really successful professional filmmaking. And that's why I became an ambassador for their product. So I'm going to talk to you about um, a lot of their products. And then we're going to talk about some really cool, like composition and framing things about, you know, how to make better films. Um, I'm going to start off talking to you not about our flagship cinema camera, the Panasonic S1H that has dual native ISO and incredible 14 and a half stop dynamic range. I'm not going to talk about that at all. I am not going to talk to you about the GH6. This is the Panasonic GH6 that is a micro four thirds camera that's got micro four thirds cameras, lenses that are half the weight of full frame lenses and has itself dual native ISO and all kinds of seven and a half stop internal stabilizers and a fan on there that can make sure you can record at super high bit rates for an unlimited amount of time. Not gonna talk about that. We're not gonna discuss that at all. And we are also not going to talk about the S5 Mark II, which just came out three months ago and has a ridiculous amount of cinema built into a really, really small form factor at an industry leading price. Gerald Undone, who's a, a YouTuber who's totally independent of Panasonic, calls this the greatest value camera on the market. We're not going to talk about that. No. Um, we are going to talk for a minute about the Panasonic G95. And the reason we're going to talk about the G95 is it has awesome capability for photo and video. And I feel like I'm talking to a group of people who, um, you know, like a lot of students are getting into filmmaking and getting into photography and need something that is an entry level product that gives professional results. And that's exactly what this G95 is. So we're going to just talk for a few seconds about the top features. It has a 20 megapixel sensor. It shoots in 4K 30 frames and it has variable frame rate, which means you can shoot in slow-mo up to 4K 120 frames a second. That is super, super cool 4K at that frame rate. It also has the internal in-body stabilizer. So there was a bunch of students that just came through and I talked to a, a really good number of them about like what's different about Panasonic? Like why, why should you choose this over another brand? Well, it's really the filmmaking and photo capabilities and the internal stabilizer that we have. Nobody in the industry has an internal stabilizer like Panasonic. Every single one of these cameras I just mentioned has an industry leading internal stabilizer for their price point, right? So that means that I literally can pop this camera off you can kind of like shake it around, but the sensor inside is on a gimbal and it sensor doesn't move. So that internal, that it stabilizes that image so well, better than any other brand in the market. That's why Panasonic Lumix has been such a great leader in filmmaking at a consumer, prosumer level, if that makes sense. Um, we, we can get in on the ground floor, learn how to make films, and then slowly graduate from one product to another well, this is where we start. And this camera, the G95, has got five axis dual in-body stabilizer as good as any other camera in our full line all the way up, right? It also has V-Log internal. V-Log is a flattened color profile that allows you to get a better dynamic range out of your image. 
and it comes built in. Now you have to color grade a V-log image, which means you color grade it like the matrix or a teal and orange or whatever your formula is that you wanna make your look, film look the way you want your film to look. But V-log gives you that opportunity to shoot a flat image and then color grade it how you want. Most camera brands charge extra for that or don't come with that. Certainly not at this price point. That's a teaser. We'll get there in a second. It also comes with a kit lens that's 12 to 60 millimeter kit lens. And then it also comes with an audio jack so I can put an inter a microphone like this, a wireless mic. I can put a receiver on the other end and have really pro audio inside this camera. And then finally, it's got 422 real-time output over HDMI, which means I can live stream with this camera. So you've got a pro 20 megapixel sensor. You've got great video capabilities with 4K 30p at, four, at really good frame rates. You've got an internal stabilizer. You've got V-Log. You've got a kit lens, that, a 12 to 60 lens that gives you really good range. You've got an internal, uh, like a jack that you can put audio to your films. And then you've got this output over HDMI that gives you live streaming capabilities. Well, that is ridiculous. How much does this cost? For students, Nelson Photo is giving it for $665. For under $700, you can have a really pro entry-level camera that can get you into filmmaking like a professional right away. Okay, I needed to get that off my chest. Nelson Photo is awesome. If you have any questions about any of the camera gear I'm about to explain or filmmaking, Nelson Photo can help you. They're offering 5 to 10% off of any accessories for students. And then obviously have these ridiculous deals like $665 for this G95. And they're actually doing $1,000 off for students on the GH6, which is the super pro level camera. It's around $1,200 to $1,400 list price. Uh, you know, like final price with the thousand dollars off. Okay, that's awesome. Now let's talk about filmmaking, framing. Okay, when we're doing, when we're thinking about, we're going to talk a lot about framing, composition, and why Hollywood films do what they do. Like, why does it matter, and why should I care? And we're going to talk about it. So when we're framing something, we want to frame something. It's always the rule of thirds, right? So you see the screen up there, we've got the guy in the rule of thirds, he's right in the middle. Well, the main focus in the rule of thirds is these four action points. And you're gonna watch, like you need to watch your Netflix movies, you need to watch your, uh, you know, start streaming your stuff, your, move, your favorite movies from your favorite directors, and you're gonna start to notice that a lot of stuff happens in these locations in the frame, right? Now we've put this character right in the center. Okay, that's great. One thing that some people do, if you're gonna put them off center, you don't wanna put them all the way over here. You're gonna give too much negative space over here. You don't want them over here. Sometimes people will do an interview and they put them over here and there's too much room over there. You'd wanna hit them right on the thirds, right? You put them here looking this way or you put them here looking that way. And that's gonna give, it's, it draw, our eyes are immediately drawn to these four action points in a frame. You look at this image and it's a stunning cinematic image. And how did the, how did the cinematographer do? Well, he hit them almost perfectly in that little bottom left four point right there, right? It's a beautiful image and we're drawn to it. I mean, you look at this image and immediately, all of us, we see the man in the image, even though he's tiny. We see him. We're like, what's there? What's in that spot? It's because we're just drawn to that spot in the image. Same thing with classic movie Up from Pixar. That is not an accident. They put things in the right spot, the right time. Framing is always intentional in filmmaking. Um, look at these. I mean, I'm going to show you a bunch of little images here. This is not an accident that that is on the exact third. That horizon is on the money on that third. That's a really beautifully framed shot. Again, action points, right? Like these are specific, these are intentional, and they're beautiful. And you're going to watch films, like we watch films, and what's funny is that we're all great critics. Every single one of us, we might not be great filmmakers, but we're learning, right? We're all trying to get better and better. 
But how do we get better and better? It's by not just being a great critic because we all look at it and if this lady, if, if she was here, it might just look weird, a little off to us. And we wouldn't necessarily know why. If she was here, it would definitely seem weird. But when she's right there, it's just aesthetically pleasing to us. Okay, so that's framing in the rule of thirds. Let's talk about symmetry. Great cinematographers use great symmetry, right? You can't be lazy in your framing and your shot composition. You need to be intentional. These We hit right on the rule of thirds and we hit right on those action points for the spots we want. It's not just their faces. Obviously, it's the faces. But look at what they're holding and look at the symmetry of it. And it's just, the, you know, it's it's a clean, great feel. And we're going to talk about breaking rules in a minute, which breaking rules is just as important, but we break rules for a reason. We don't break rules because we're bad cinematographers. And that's the problem is a lot of amateur filmmakers will break rules and be like, well, I'm being an artist. No, you're being amateurish. So be specific and learn the rules follow the rules, and then when you break them, you break them on purpose in order to evoke a specific reaction from your audience. So this, this is a Wes Anderson film. Wes Anderson is classic with his framing, and he creates frames that literally any frame of a Wes Anderson film, I challenge you to do this, go to a Netflix, go to an HBO Max, whatever, and just freeze any frame of a Wes Anderson film I bet it's a picture you could put on a wall. That is what he tries to do in every one of his films is make every frame of his film a photo you could pull out and put on your wall and it'd be a pretty picture because his symmetry is perfect and his he creates frames and he lets his action move inside the frame. It's a lot. But he's created this great frame with all this great detail and background. Like, don't look at the people. Look at what's in the background. There's, it's so well decorated. It's such, it's got such character and culture. And then he places his actors in the right spot, perfectly symmetrical in the frame. And then he creates a great foreground with images right in front here. And look at these tips of this is right on that lower third right there. The eyeballs are right on that upper third and that's perfectly symmetrical. It's great composition. Shot composition. Wow, look at that. I mean, it's perfectly, and and you're you've got guides in your cameras. Like every Panasonic camera has great guides. It has those exact thirds. You can make sure that you're on the money on your composition. But we miss as filmmakers all the time. That doesn't mean we throw it away. It means in post we we're specific about. Oh, let me correct that image. I can zoom in a little. And when we're shooting in high resolution 4K which you can with the GH6, you can with the S5 Mark II, and you can with that G95. You can shoot in 4K 30 frames a second or 24 frames a second, and then you can crop in and reframe and post and not lose any resolution at all. Um, so perfectly symmetrical. Let's talk next about leading lines okay this is one of my favorite things because this is something that is really hard to accomplish but when you do you're about to see some shots from some films that just are stunning i mean the leading lines in a frame point to where we're supposed to look so um it's it's a basic concept but filmmaking is a director's medium right as a director, I get to choose where the actors look. They say theater is an actor's medium because there's a theater stage and we're in the audience and the, the actors move around on the stage and we can decide wherever we want to look, but the actors are drawing our attention. But in a film, no, 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 The director draws your attention. Well, how do I do that? I do that with leading lines. And all these lines are pointing to the middle, which is pointing down the road which is telling us the story that he is driving off into the sunset. And I don't feel good about it. I don't know about you, but it definitely seems chaotic, uneasy, and dangerous. I don't know. It's telling us things, and we love it. So this is, uh, this is the secret life of Walter Mitty, this film. And he is walking this way, and the leading lines are telling us exactly that. 
but these buildings are pointing to the middle because in this shot, he actually is only going to walk to here, but it's telling us it's point. You see that you see the dimension in it. You see how it's pointing to the center of the frame, but then it's he's walking along a line that is telling us exactly where he's going. Right. Beautiful. Leading lines. You see these leading lines are pointing right towards our actor, right towards where we want to look. Obviously, his focus, you know, the director and the cinematographer <clears throat> have chosen focus. So they're dialing in the focus and they're blurring out the back. So this is called depth of field, obviously, right? Depth of field means that our subject in the foreground is in focus and the subject behind is blurry. And you want to you wanna get a really kind of like a fast lens in order to accomplish that, a 1.7 lens, a 1.4, a 1.2. Um, those lenses can be, can be expensive, which is why you spend $665 on your camera body. You've got more money to spend on a beautiful, fast lens. They give you really, really nice blur like this, right? So again, though, like a lot of cinematographers might just show up at the train track and just shoot him straight on and not think about the fact that these train track leading lines are pointing right to the character. Like use the leading lines when you're deciding how to compose your shots. All right. I think we're about to break the rules. Oh, no, we're going to talk about depth first. We'll break the rules next. So this is depth. Anytime you can have depth in your shot, it's going to be more interesting. So you don't want to create so much depth that it distracts from the background, but you've got all these leading lines leading right to what's happening here where this guy is about to do something really bad to this guy. Um, but basically what we've got is we have depth to it. It's really a beautifully composed shot. And look, this is a scene that we see in movies all the time, right? It's like the interrogation scene. It's, it's in a basement. It's like they're going to beat the guy up and ask him all these questions. How interesting is it to take that same exact scene that on the page probably said, Joe beats up James, and that's it, and tries to ask him, get, get, get the, get the, the um, stuff out of him that we need to get out of him, right? But this cinematographer, this director, decided to put it on a train yard and add depth to it to create this gorgeous shot. It's it just makes it so much more interesting than just having it in a basement, right? Um, here we are. So this is this is beautiful depth in this shot because this is the top of a of a you know like a a big huge battleship, and you've got the guy up here. Obviously, something's going on with him, but you have so much depth in this shot. I wish I could show you the video of it. They're working. Everyone's moving and working at the same time. There's, there's so many layers to this shot. It's just so interesting. And then obviously we have the ocean moving down below it. So you have so much um, 3D space. And that's something that we need to think about in filmmaking as we all the time is how do I have different levels of 3D space? Because that's going to make my image come alive. A photo on a wall, it's two dimensional. It looks flat. But when things are moving, like the water is moving at a different rate of speed than the workers who are on that bottom deck. And then you have actually this next level here where you have this level of people working at a different 3D space. And then we have our actor in agony in the foreground that is just, you know, I mean, obviously the story is going to be what's happening to this actor in this moment. But man, they've created so much depth in this shot, right? So cool. Okay. Come on, let me break the rules, please. Let's see. Do they let me break the rules yet? No! Frame within frame. All right, we're going to talk about this really quick. So another cool convention in filmmaking is to create a frame within the frame, right? So we obviously have our widescreen, um, you know, like 16 by 9, or in, in filmmaking, lots of times on a, on a cinema screen, it'll be 235 to 1. So your aspect ratio matters, right? What you choose. Do I want it like, you know, 16 by 9 is a TV we have at home. But uh, in the movie theater, we do it really wide. Sometimes it's 185 to 1. Sometimes it's 235 to 1. Okay? But now they've created this frame within the frame where they've got a nice little square. And all your action is happening inside that frame where these guys are trying to break out of this jail. Super cool. 
So this shot actually starts with no faces at all. Like you don't get to see the faces at all. You just see this box in the frame. And then all of a sudden these heads pop in and we see that they're looking down. And then obviously we're gonna shoot the reverse and we're gonna see what's happening. Uh, this is a cool frame within a frame where we've got this widescreen of this, you know, this composition where this guy is on the phone and she's listening in. So we have two different frames within the frame. We love it. So many cool things. Oh, I think we're going to get there. I think we're going to get there. We're going to get to breaking the rules. So we're breaking the rules. What does that mean? Well, that means we understand that leading lines are important, but what if we threw leading lines across the frame and we just made it like disruptive and jagged is it creates a motion in your audience. It creates an uneasiness. This guy's about to walk across and fall into, you know, fall off the edge. And, and the music is going to help with that as well. But it's the visual leading lines that have broken and are, are distracting and not normal. This is from, um, I, Christopher Nolan does this all the time. Uh, this is Inception. And constantly in Inception, the leading lines are pointing this way and then they're pointing that way. It just makes us not know which way is up, which way is down. Um, this is a, is a rule break because it's not in the, it's not in one of our lower fours, but this is a moment where we don't know where to look and he's lost in this moment. So we see this, this scene on this train track several times in this movie. And sometimes he has direction. Sometimes he's knows exactly where to go. And this scene, he doesn't know where to go. And consequently, as a, as, as an audience, we don't know where to look. Um, and then this is the King's speech. He's, he's uncomfortable. He doesn't know how to talk. He, he's, he's nervous and he, we, we throw him off. We don't give him the benefit of being right on that line on any, on any plane. So there's too much headroom and there's no looking room. It's a total rule break, but it makes us as uncomfortable as him. So those are just some things to think about when you think about composition and framing. Remember, if you have any questions about Panasonic Lumix gear, please talk to Nelson Photo. They're running great deals. The, the G95-665, the Panasonic uh, GH6 is $1,000 off, I think, in, for the next month or so for students. So thank you so much. My name is Matthew Sutherland from Panasonic. <laughs>